if anybody is interested in my online course, there's a discount code there. If anybody wants it, is interested in taking that later on, you are more than welcome to. Today, we are going to look at... It's, this isn't specific farm-related stuff. This is actually stuff that could be useful to many different operations. We're just going to look at how we use information to leverage our, our experience, basically, to expedite your learning curve. I think information is something that's often overlooked. It's most often overlooked by farmers. It's maybe a little bit more talked about in the, in the, in the traditional business world, but I often find that the managing of information and, and systems are the things that farmers are always failing on. I, I consult for many different farmers throughout the US, and it's often their biggest weak, weak point. So I, I'm all about tackling the weakest link, and I think this is one of the, the weakest links in the space of agriculture. And so we're really gonna dive in today and, and, and go head first into some of the systems that I use and how I manage information. The way I see it, information is like a seed. It's like seeds. You have to harvest those seeds. You've got to thresh them, clean them, and sort them in order for them to be useful. So information is the exact same thing, and that's what this is going to be all about today, is we're going to look at how I manage information on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, how I review it at the end of the year, and then how I use that information to improve things um, on the farm. So I just want to point to some free resources that I have available. So my YouTube channel has a ton of stuff on there. I've, I'm posting videos every single week, and I'm answering questions on it every single day. Um, you know, if you're not on my online course, that's a way to access me. I don't really have time to answer emails any longer from people, but on the YouTube channel, if that information can help others, then I, I'd prefer to help people there because then it's, it's, it's useful, more useful for, for as long as YouTube is, on, is online. This is a show that I did with Diego Fuder, the organizer of our wonderful conference this week. And we did, we had about 43 or 44 episodes basically tracked uh, my season every single week for the entire season. There's a ton of good information in there that um, you, you'll probably get addicted to it. Diego and I have a really good rapport and uh, we had a lot of good conversations on this show. It was a total blast to do. We're going to do it again next year. So check it out if you haven't heard of it already. A lot of the stuff that, well actually all the stuff we're going to talk today, you can get on my website for free. A lot of it's in the book, but when I wrote the book, I wrote way too many words and had way too many charts and they had space for. So all those extra things are on my website. They're free. Just go to urbanfarmer.co slash book and then select that free extras thing. And it's a download of all the spreadsheets, the fresh sheet we're going to talk about. There's even land contracts and stuff in there that we won't talk about today, but I do talk about in my, in my one-day workshop that we're going to be doing in this room tomorrow all day. So all the spreadsheets and everything that I'm going to show you today is there. You can get it for free, even if you don't have my book. So these are my 10 keys to success that I, that I think were things that really helped me when I was starting, and I attribute a lot of the success of my farm in such a short period of time to these things. We're going to look at the main, these two, the ones that I've circled, market research and how to track and measure everything. Those, that's what we're going to spend the next three hours on. And we'll have lots of time for questions and stuff too. But I just want to go through this list because I think it's important to keep, to keep these things in mind. Uh, so market research is crucial because if you don't know what you're getting into when you start selling or you start farming or whatever enterprise you're going to get into, if you don't know where you're at, you, don't, you have no idea if what you're going to do is going to work. So the one thing I often tell people is, number one, never walk into a saturated market. Never go to the place where everybody's already doing what you're doing, because then you won't be the story. You won't, you won't be the first mover. And there's a, there, there's a, that's a common phrase in the technology industry is the first, the first mover advantage or the first to market. That's really key, because often when I teach people about urban agriculture or market gardening, they think they want to go to the Bay Area, or they want to go to Northern California, or they want to go to the place that there's already a big scene of people doing it. And there's some value to that in some ways. You've got camaraderie, you've got a support group, you've even got people that you might be able to share resources with. At the same time, you've got a lot of competition right out of the gate. And that's something that I think is 
can make or break you. I've, I've seen many farmers come and go in my town, in Kelowna, BC, who say, oh, I want to go and do this where Curtis is doing it because he's already you know, laid out the groundwork, which is true, but do you really want to compete with me? <laughs> you don't. I've actually seen three market gardeners come and go in my town, and I encourage them. Actually, when, when, they came, when they came to Kelowna, I said, yeah, come on in. I'll sh- come over to my farm. I'll show you everything I know. But they just couldn't capture market share. They set up at the farmer's market. They couldn't sell anything. Tried to get at the restaurants. They just couldn't get in there. So it's better to not walk into a saturated market. Another one in, in British Columbia is Vancouver. People are like, yeah, I'm going to be an urban farmer. I'm going to go to Vancouver. Well, then you've got to compete with Chris Thoreau. You've got to compete with all these other urban farmers that are there. It's like, don't do that. Go to the place where you can be the frontiers person, where you can be on the front lines. And you'll always be remembered as the first person to do it. And it'll always be a news story. Because that's the thing, that this is still a very new thing. Urban agriculture, market gardening is still very new. So if you can be the first person in your town or wherever you are to do it, that has a ton of value and, and, and longevity to it as well. But we will get into a lot more detail about our market research shortly here. Second thing, I actually think this is probably one of the most important reasons that I'm here today that I'm talking to you guys after six years is that I had mentors. I sought out people in my local area and went to them and asked them specifically about things that were relevant to where I was. And I did this with business people, with farmers, with conventional farmers, organic farmers, all kinds of people. Because if you go to the source, you can get the high-grade information, and that's really important. And essentially, you guys are doing that today. You're coming to events like this. This is high-grade information. You're going st- talking straight to producers. That's key. And I think you should constantly strive to find mentors. I still have mentors today. I like to think that I I like to surround myself with three types of people. People that are 10 years ahead of me and where I'd like to be. People that are at my level and they're in my peer group. They're my friends and they're, they're, they're moving forward and they're striving for similar things, whether it's in the exact same sector or not, but they have similar ambitions. And then people that are maybe a couple years or a few years behind me that are people that I can help. And if you have three peop- people like that in your life, it's very fulfilling, but it can, keeps you moving forward because your surroundings are those kind of people that share your values and that are moving forward. And I, I really attribute that to, to the reason I'm here after six years of farming. Start small, grow incrementally. Don't take on too much. I'll just kind of blast through these. Start small and grow to what your market is demanding. You can kill an operation if you take on too much overhead at once. You don't need to own land. I think we all understand this concept very, uh, by now. If you've, if you've come here, if you've been here hearing some of the other conversations or you're familiar with my stuff, we don't need to go over that too much. Keeping your overhead low is very key, and it's the backbone to what we do on our farm. Our operational expenses are very low, and we can essentially run our farm as a two-person operation at about 60 hours a week total between two people. Generally, we, f- we focus on higher value markets than crops. So... That doesn't mean we, don't, we discriminate against places that aren't those. It just means that if we have the option, we'll always go for the higher value. And that's just business, common business sense in a way, but it makes your life easier and it makes you more money, essentially. Tracking and measure everything. This is so key and we are going to spend most of this workshop talking about exactly that. And it is... Another main reason that I'm here today is I I learned all the things that were working and what didn't, and I would continuously double down on the things that were working and eliminating the things that wasn't. But if you're not tracking your stuff, if you're not tracking this information, you don't know where you're at. So that's why we're going to spend so much time on this today. Appropriate technology, a lot of tools, and software systems. These are things that I use. My smartphone being one of my most used tools on the farm. Actually, is my most used tool on the farm. All these things help you leverage your workload and your experience. Focusing on the tasks that pay, that actually links very much to tracking and measuring everything, is y- y- you want to know how to, you want to know what are the things that pay and what do they pay, and you can't figure that out unless you track the numbers. Stacking and optionality, this is something that's very important on our farm, is always finding multiple uses for things as far as products, tools, and systems but that will save for tomorrow. So I actually am, was not a spreadsheet person at all. I, it's not something that I had a history of doing. 
It's something that I got into when I was tree planting. This is actually the only picture I could find of me tree planting. This is a very Canadian job. This is something that a lot of younger people do to put themselves through college. Jean-Martin Fortier and I were both tree planters for close to 10 years. And it's a job that is, is very physically demanding, and it's a piecework job. So you go out, and you plant trees, and you get paid per tree. So it often creates entrepreneurs, because you really learn firsthand how to, you know, you, you take what you make. What you put in is what you get. And if you want to sit around, and you're lazy, and you're unmotivated, you're not going to make any money. So this is actually where I learned my work ethic, was in the bush, tree planting. And... I did this for nine years, so I put myself through college with this, I paid off most of my student debts with this. Tree planters in Canada can make pretty good money, like I, in my later years I was, I was averaging $550 a day doing this. When I started I could make, you know, I barely made minimum wage in my first year. But what happened in my, I believe it was my fifth year of tree planting, so for my last four years of tree planting I actually started to use spreadsheets, it was my first experience with spreadsheets. And it was at that point that I really started to make good money at tree planting. It wasn't so much because my technique was, any much, was much better than it was before. It was that I was, able to consist, I was able to set goals and benchmarks and consistently keep my eye on the prize and stay focused. And that's really what this information is all about, is setting a goal. So it's just like in a, if you're planning a farm. How much money do I want to make on my farm this year? Let's say you want to make 80000 on your farm. That's your end goal. How many weeks do you have to do that? Okay, I've got 30 weeks. Divide 30 by 80000 That'll give you an average. So that means you need to achieve that average each week. And so when I was tree planting, that's essentially what I did. As I said, okay, I'm going to make 20000 this season. I've got 60 days to work. How much money do I need to make each day to get to that average? And I consistently checked in on this spreadsheet. I had a grand total on the bottom, and then it, was a, it, was, it calculated a sum, and I'd put my days in as I went, and I would see that number. I had it subtracted from my total of how much more money I needed to make, and I constantly looked at my average to make sure that I was going to my average. And so I have done the same thing on my farm over all these years, and it was the thing that really allowed me to start managing better and, and staying focused on the numbers, because the numbers don't lie. You need to have goals, consistent goals. You need to have long-term, medium, and short-term goals. This is how you can make these things happen. If you don't have a goal, then you'll never get to a number. If you don't have a plan on how to get to that goal, then you won't know where you're at, because you need to constantly check in. And so what we're going to look at today, this is just a slideshow of my farm as I'm talking about this, what, what we're going to look at today is how we do all that, how we track this information, how we create habits to do that, how do we spend time in the office, and how do we review that information on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and then on a, on a yearly basis at the end of the season. This stuff is, is very key. It's, it's sometimes a little dry, right? It's, it's, it's probably not the most exciting thing to talk about in farming, you know, if I had to choose one thing, I'd, I'd want to talk more about my high rotation beds or my interplanting with tomatoes or my new passive solar greenhouse. That, that's the really exciting stuff. But um, farming isn't all glamour, right? It's not all fun and games. It's not all going to the farmer's market and socializing. There's a lot of things in farming that just have to get done. And if they don't get done, then you can lag behind. So... That's what we are going to get into today. And I'll take questions at a certain period, and we'll, we'll just kind of do questions in sessions instead of having uh, you guys blurt them out as we go. It, it, I find it just creates a better atmosphere, a better experience. Will you do these questions for me for people? I will, absolutely, yeah. So... Um, what do we track and how, how can this help us? So there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of things you can track and some things are more important than others. It's important to track most things like what, what do you, what's going into your farm, what's coming off the farm, what are you selling, what are you not selling. There's a lot of things that are really important with that. But with what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to show you what are the key things to track, what things are less important, what things are critical to be tracking consistently, and then what are things that you can track later on that don't have as much importance. So I'm talking about things like what you plant in the field, what do you harvest off the field, 
What do you have for restaurant orders this week? What were your orders in previous weeks? When a chef makes an order and they ask for 10 units of this and you deliver eight units of this, then that's something that you can track as well. That's called short. It's very important to track your shortages because then you can see trends. You can say, oh, I was short consistently for these weeks, for these products all the time. And then that information will help you create a better scenario next year on how you can come back with more product. So these are all things that we use to look at trends to speculate on the future. So it's, it's a lot like people in the stock market, really. They're looking at graphs and they're looking at trends and, 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 and people's behaviors and then adjusting their behavior according to that and then leveraging that so that they can be more successful with it. But before we get into how we track and exactly what we're going to track, we need to know our market. You need to know what is out there and you know, where are you going to sell your stuff. So we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at farmers markets and restaurants right now, and we're going to look at how we do market research to even assess if we want to sell there, if that's a place that we can actually work. So let's take a look at farmers markets. So there's some things about a farmers market that are key to know. First being, what is your market? So what, what is that farmers market all about? Is it, is, it, is it a really busy market? Is it slow? How long is the season for this market? Um, is there a waiting list to get on this market? This is really important to understand before you even think about selling to a farmer's market because I've, I've seen some farmers where they say, okay, I'm going to sell at this market, I'm going to show up, and they say, well, you didn't apply, and there's a six-month waiting period, and there's an $800 fee to get in. So you need to have all those things assessed. You can usually find that out on their websites. Just go to the, that market, that particular market, and see, and see what they're asking of, of, of vendors. Often there's paperwork that you need to fill out. The other thing that you want to look at, even before you start selling at a market, is you're probably better to shop there for a, a good period of time. And I, I did that before I started selling at my market. I was a shopper there for about a year. And I was constantly looking at what other vendors were selling, what kind of people were coming there, what were some of the, the demographics there. Learning some basic information about that farmer's market is really important. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to help you when you want to show up to that market. The next thing is, who are your customers? So when we're looking at a farmer's market, who are the people coming there? What's the primary age group? What is the socioeconomics of it, if you can guess? Sometimes you might not have access to that information. What's the gender? I find at farmer's markets, women consistently buy most of everything. Usually when, it's, when there's couples or families, the, 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 the wife or the, um, the, the woman is pulling her husband along to make the purchase, and the guy's kind of like, okay, are we done? Can we get out of here? So that's important stuff to know. And it might not be that way for all markets. I, that's just how it is in my market. It's important to understand that because how you target your marketing, how you display things at your stand are, are important. And we're not going to talk about how I do displays and all that. That's, that's more stuff for uh, tomorrow's workshop. But, you know, what, what is the group of people here? Is, is, there, is there a particular predominant cultural group at that market? Some of the Vancouver farmers markets are like 80% um, Asians. Chinese, Southeast Asians, you name it, that's important to understand because that might help you customize what you're going to grow depending on what you think their, their purchasing habits are. You know, what, what are these people buying? What do you see there? Just assessing the marketplace. This is really nothing new to business, but I, I see a lot of farmers don't really look at that stuff. They don't really think about it. The other thing that's really important is just a lifestyle piece is do the people you see at that market do you think they align with your values? Is it the kind of market you want to be at? Because there's some, there's some markets are polar opposites. You've got the markets where there's a lot of buy and seller type vendors. They're just buying produce and selling it. So they're just flipping stuff. They're not really farmers per se, right? So that kind of market might not share your values. Whereas then there's other types of markets that are strict about you got to make it, bake it, or grow it. Like that's my farmer's market is in Kelowna is exactly that. If you don't make that stuff, grow it or any of that, then you, you can't sell at that market. 
So that, I, I would align that one with more, more with my values and, 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 and assess that there's probably pe people at that farmer's market that would value what I do more than somebody who's just looking for cheap produce. So it's really important to assess that, all the values and how they align with yours. So your customers, who are, who are the best ones? Once you start selling at a market, or even you can perceive this before you even sell at a market, if you're going to some particular... Um, vendors at your market and you start to see that there's certain regulars around there, who are they? What's their story? What are their demographics? Apply what we just looked at um, on the last one to those people. Once you're selling at the market, that's when you, your market research will further in a way, is that you will identify very quickly who is your 80-20. So if some of you were here at my, la my last talk on uh, two days ago, I was talking about the Pareto principle, the rule of 80-20. 20% of your customers will bring you 80% of your business. Who are those people? What are, their, what are their demographics, socioeconomics, average gender, average age? Who are those people? What are their names? What do they like? Are there more things you can do to cater to those customers? Because I find a big part of, of success at a farmer's market is continuously offering more value to the people that bring you the most value. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's, maybe it seems like common sense, Sometimes I wonder if common sense isn't very common, but it, you know, what can you do to bring more value to them? We consistently strive to do that. When I'm at my market, the first, the first thing, I always have a notebook with me, and I take down and I write down the names of all the people that I don't know, and they, they, if, they, if they appear to be a customer that is coming back and I don't know their name, I ask them their name, and when they're not looking, I write it down and make a little note about them so that the next time they come, I know their name. And this is a very old idea, but the, the sweetest sound to a person's ear is their own name. And you can remember your core customers' names, they'll bring their friends back, and uh, that will grow a very solid support group for your business. And the great thing about when you have a customer base like this is that you can continuously ask them on what you can improve on. What are the things that you can offer them more of what are the things they'd like to see less of? Because when people develop a relationship with you, they'll be more forthcoming with information than somebody you don't know. So that is really important at a farmer's market. So what are they buying? What are the things, so you know, even before you're selling at a market, what are the things that you see are popular? What are the items that there's might, maybe some abundance or scarcity of? There's one trick you can do at a farmer's market before you even sell there on how to figure out what you should grow and what you shouldn't, is you show up in the morning, make some notes and take some pictures on your phone with what you see on the tables, and then come back an hour or half hour before closing and then do a split test, see what's left on the tables. The things that are left on the tables are the things that there's not clearly a demand for, and the things that were gone fast are the things that there is a demand for. This is really telling even about a community, not just the farmer's market, you can see where the demand for things are, and you can compare that to other, we'll, look at, we'll talk about restaurants in a few moments, but you can constantly learn information about this, because there's going to be seasonality to this too. What are people buying a lot of in the spring? What are people buying a lot of in the summer? What was available in the morning? What was, what was gone by the afternoon? And also looking at what, what, what are the top dogs? You know, who are the people at that farmer's market that are moving the biggest volume. At my market, there's about four vendors that are huge. They might do $6,000 a, $6, a day in sales. What are they selling? What are their customers buying? Sometimes you don't want to compete with those kind of vendors, especially if they're offering a similar product to you. So looking at all these patterns that you see at a farmer's market will tell you a lot about how you should design your farm. And it will correlate to restaurants. And so what are their purchasing habits? How, if this is a Saturday market, when are the most amount of people there? At our market, between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. is the busiest time because it's the time that all the locals come. Because the locals want to avoid the tourist rush. The tourists usually show up later in the day because they're probably out partying on the beach late the, the night before. They sleep in. They all show up at once to the market and they're just kind of touring around with their cotton candy, taking up space. 
The locals don't like that. The locals want to come in. They want to chat with their farmer. They want to get their stuff. They still want to have a good experience, but they want to get out of there before the tourists come. So that, that could be different at any kind of market, but it's, it's important to understand wh when, do, when do they come in? When do they come out? Because when I, when I know that, when I set up at my market, I know that I want to be ready to rock and roll right at 8 o'clock because I even have some customers coming at 7.30 as I'm setting up, my really core customers. So you want to make sure that you're ready for those customers because, again, that's your 80-20. Those are the people that are going to continuously support you. So you want to make sure that they have the least path of, the re of resistance to come through and buy stuff from you to give you their money come in and out and make it easy as you can for them. By, the, by, by mid-afternoon at our farmer's market, we really slow down. We'll see hundreds of people walking by, but we're just sitting there, kind of twiddling our thumbs. By that point, we've probably sold 90% of our stuff. But it's, under, it's, it's important to understand those patterns, because it's not necessarily going to be the same at every market. It depends where your market is. My market is on a parking lot. It's hot. So in the summertime, the locals, they're over it at that point. The tourists come because it's nice and they're just walking around having a good time. But those patterns will tell you a lot about how you can sell, how you can display, when you should be set up, and all these kind of things. What are the products you should have, and what, it, what, are, what are the things about your customers that, that you can cater to? All right. So there's a lot to selling to chefs. A lot of nuances here. This is kind of a who, what, when, where, why, and how of dealing with restaurants. Uh, tomorrow, we'll get into restaurants more if you're coming to the workshop. But these are the, some of the things as far as market research goes. So we're essentially talking about any restaurants that are under the field to fork category. So restaurants that are buying local, they're sourcing local, they brag about that on their menu, they use seasonal products, they're basically your target demographic of what you want to sell to. These are the kind of restaurants you're targeting. And before you even approach restaurants, you should have a really good skeleton of what are the restaurants you want to approach and know some information about them before you even show up, before you even send an email or make a phone call you should know a lot about them. Easiest way to do it at first is just a simple Google search. Just search farm to table or field to fork restaurants in your town. What pops up? If you scroll through Yelp, if you use the, the, the app Yelp, if you put in farm to table, field to fork, what pops up in San Diego? Source out, that's your starting list. And then you'll filter down from there. So you want to make a list, and then we'll go through some other processes to see is this the kind of restaurant customer that we want to sell to? So what's the price point of these restaurants and, and who's eating there? So just like we looked at at the farmer's market, what is the demographic of people eating there? That can tell you a lot about what, you're gonna, what they might be interested in buying. So if it's an Asian cuisine restaurant and they're using things like pak choys and bok choys and, and daikon radish, there's a, that's information for you. What, what can I go and market them? So you're not going to go into a Thai restaurant and be really trying to talk to them about how great your romaine lettuce is or, you know, your tomatoes. You want to you customize what you're going to bring to what they need based on previous information that you've sussed out. Because you don't want to go in, you don't want to go in ignorant. So, you know, what is, what is the price point with, with the food there? Lower price points generally means, and not always... There's always exceptions out there, but generally, if the price points are low, they're probably not buying local stuff. But often, there isn't really that much of a price difference. I'm often quite surprised, it, just even through tra traveling through California, when I go to restaurants that are serving local, I'm, I'm often quite surprised on how affordable it actually is. Because a lot of it isn't just strictly to do with the price point that they're buying, it's how they manage their kitchen, so there's a lot of other nuances there, if they're efficient or not. But I've, you know, I, I go to Field to Fork restaurants all the time, and sometimes it might only be 20% more than what you'd see at, a, at an average restaurant. <coughs> Obviously, we're not talking about Denny's and McDonald's and, and, and chains. We're talking about places that are, that are going to use local and quality stuff, organic stuff. So the price point is always going to be a little bit higher. But a general rule of thumb is that if you're looking at restaurants, maybe it's of this list, 
because there's a lot of restaurants that, that lie about this, right? There's a lot of restaurants that just say they buy local and they actually don't. So the price point will tell you a lot. And that might be your first sort of red flag. How much does an entree cost at that restaurant? Is it a, is it a $15 entree or is it a $35 entree? More likely the $35 entree is going to be paying a better price to buy local food. Because if you want to buy local food, you need to pay a farmer what they c need to make a living on, right? So, so that's, that's where the price, the price point comes from. So the cheap stuff generally might be your, your first red flag, but you never know. And again, you know, uh, uh, with the values, just like with the, with the farmer's market, does that restaurant share your values? So this is more of just the quality of life piece, right? It's not so much about economics I've sold to some restaurants that don't necessarily share my values. They might as far as using local and quality produce, but they're assholes and they're really high maintenance and, and I don't want to deal with prima donnas. So I've had to fire chefs in, in some years because I just I can't handle working with them. So it's important for that to, to understand, do they share your values? Because ultimately all, we all want to have fun doing this. We want to enjoy our lifestyle. So it's really important to, to, to assess the whole holistic approach to it. Do they share your values? Can they actually pay you a, um, a price that is reasonable for you to make a fair living at what you're doing? So a lot of that comes from the price point. So if they do source local, where do they get their stuff from? Is there competition? Do you know any farmers that sell at those restaurants? You can, you can call a restaurant and pretend to be an overzealous customer if you want to figure it out quickly. You guys ever seen that Portlandia skit where they're asking the name of the chicken and, and they, they want the whole backstory of the chicken? This, in, in, in the foodie scene, this stuff's become pretty common, actually. I think that's why they made that skit, because I've actually seen this stuff. So if you want to figure out pretty quickly, if you have competition at a restaurant, just phone them and pretend to be an overzealous customer. Where do you get your stuff? What's, what's in, okay, your Caesar salad, I see on the menu. Okay, you're using romaine. Where do you get that romaine? Just, just pretend to be an overzealous customer. You know, you don't want to annoy the hell out of them, but if they are a foodie restaurant, they're probably used to it. So you can find out pretty quickly where they'll, they're getting their stuff, and they'll tell you because they'll, they, they'll want to brag about it. If people are buying local, they're usually going to put it on their menu or they're going to say, oh, these are Green City Acres Greens, this is Wise Earth Farm stuff or whatever it is they're going to point to that. Especially in the more higher-end restaurants, they're going to say where every item comes from, so it won't be hard to figure that out. One thing that I've seen in my years of doing this is that there is fraud out there, and it's not so much fraud where people are outright lying. There's fraud in the sense that some restaurants, and this would be more on the lower end one, and you'll, you'll, you'll see this if, they, if you notice that they don't align with your values, like I said before, but you'll see restaurants that will have a farm name on their menu, and if you really ask them overzealously, like I said, if you phone and say, what are the ingredients, where do these ingredients come from, if they don't have an answer for you, they might be just BSing you. Because often what happens with restaurants, because so many people want to get on this bandwagon in the, in the culinary world, is they'll buy from a couple suppliers locally. Basically, they're just a garnish. Like, they'll have two farms that they buy $100 to $200 worth of stuff a week, but then they'll buy everything else from Cisco or GFS, like whatever the big distributor hubs are in your area. That is very common. I've actually had to say to chefs at previous time, um, take me off your menu because you're, 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 you're promoting a salad that looks like crap and it's not my salad. But it's an, it's, an awkward, it's an awkward conversation because in a way they're promoting you, but if they're bringing a, na a bad name to your product, then that might reflect it negatively on you. And so sometimes those conversations are had. It's incredibly awkward, but I've seen it because there's so many people trying to get into this scene that they just want to piggyback on it and have the easy ride, but they don't actually want to pay for the stuff. And that's, that's the thing about local. It's important to understand your value proposition when you go and talk to a chef. Because I have seen time and time again that if you buy quality local at a restaurant, you're actually going to save money. Because when most, if most restaurants are buying stuff from the big distributors, say they're buying a salad mix. That salad mix 
has been in transit. In California, this might be an anomaly because California grows a ton of salad mix. But where I'm in British Columbia, we get earthbound salad mix from California, right? It's traveled 1,500 miles, 2,000 miles. It's been in transit for a week. And when the chefs get it, it's already a week old, right? They open the bag. They use it for about two days. Almost every time, at the very least, they throw 25% of it out. And if you ask chefs, just, just ask them what their food costs are. Ask them what their spoilage costs are. Because their spoilage costs are often pretty high. So spoilage cost is what do you throw out? And that's a write-off for them. But most chefs, if you have a really honest conversation with them and get to know them, they'll tell you that they'll, they'll, they'll be throwing 25, 50% of their stuff out consistently. Right? And so this goes into that whole issue of food waste, which we, we don't have time to go down a rabbit hole with here. But this is just the reality of it. So if you're using local... Your value proposition to a chef is, say he's not totally tuned into the foodie scene yet, you can say, okay, this looks higher as a price point. It does. But you'll use 100% of it, and you'll actually be able to use less because the product will have more volume on the plate, has more fresh, it tastes better. You can use, like, less is more if the product is really good, especially with salad greens. If a, sal if, if a bag of lettuce is a week or more old, it just doesn't have the volume to stuff that's a couple days old and it's fresh and it's, and it's puffy. It uses, it has a lot more volume. I, I, the first restaurant I started selling to years ago, uh, about six years ago, this place called Sturgeon Hall, they weren't really a place that were buying local, but they liked what I was doing. And we made that value proposition. They were paying $6 a pound for greens from Cisco, organic greens from Cisco, and then I was selling to them at eight. But they told me time and time again that they actually saved money on my product because they were always able to use all of it. The shelf life was three times as long as anything they got from the distributor. So it's important to know that because that's your value proposition, right? It's like, look, you'll use more. Don't, the, the price is there, but you, oh, sorry, you'll use less of it. You'll, be, you'll get more uh, effective use of it. Um, so just going back to our, this one here is where do they s source from? It's important to not try to be a one-stop shop as a farmer. A lot, of, a lot of farmers have this fear, if they start selling to restaurants, they have this fear that if that restaurant is going to be buying from other farmers, they're afraid that it, they're going to lose business. So the, the better strategy is to just try to find a niche. Try to find a niche product that that restaurant can't get anywhere else, or maybe they only get from one or two other places, but that you're known for and really go with that. Like, I have some restaurants that all they buy from me is greens. I have other restaurants, all they buy from me is micro vegetables, baby vegetables. I have some restaurants, all they buy from me is tomatoes. Some, all they buy is microgreens and herbs. So they know me for different things. If you try to be a one-stop shop and you try to continuously just give them everything they need, there's times you're going to be short. And you don't want to be short consistently. Because if you're short consistently, they're just going to go somewhere else, especially the big restaurants. The smaller ones will have more patience with you. They'll be more willing to roll with the punches. But the big ones will say, no, I can't. I, you're not dependable enough. So in that strategy, it's better to under-promise and over-deliver than to over-promise and under-deliver. And we're going to talk about fresh sheets a little later on, and we'll talk about some of those, those strategies out there. But... You know, what, what is your competition? So are there other, if, there, if there's other farmers selling at, to that restaurant, what are they selling to that restaurant? Sometimes you could just, in a conversation, ask, ask the chef, you know, where are you guys getting your stuff from? What are you getting? And just be, be very forthcoming. Just be straight, straightforward. Is there a niche? Is there something that you're not getting that maybe I can help you with? It's all about servicing them. It's all about bringing value to them. This one is very important. How long has this restaurant been open? When did they open? When, was, when did they first open up? And how long has the executive chef worked there? That's key. Because sometimes a restaurant that's been open for five years, but it's had a different executive chef every year for five years, is the same as a restaurant that just opened. Sometimes restaurants are just dumping grounds for people to have write-offs. Like some LLC, some, some company, they buy restaurants just to throw away, just to have write-offs. And sometimes those restaurants don't really have the best work, work atmosphere, and they've got a high turnover. So it's important to know how long that chef has been there. I've got one restaurant, 
restaurant's been open for 20 years, but they've had the ex exact same executive chef for 15 of those years. That's good. Somebody that's been there for a long time, that says a lot about the integrity of the restaurant and how they do business. Whereas some, a place that has really high turnover, they've got a new executive chef every couple years and they've got consistent turnover in their staff, volatile environment, tough to work in. As a farmer, sometimes really tough to deal with. You know, when you're starting out, sometimes you have to deal with those personalities. You have to kind of deal with the prima donna chef. I'm at a place right now where I don't have to anymore. I've, I've told chefs to go, and, to go and stick it at times. Not that often. I, I'm very, very fortunate to work with a really cool group of chefs that have been very supportive over the years. But I'm not going to deal with drama. Somebody yelling at me on the phone about something that they thought they said and something that I, that I thought I heard, and it's just a he said, she said kind of thing, I don't have time for that. So I don't, I don't want to deal with these super high maintenance agro types of chefs that want to just chew everybody out. So learning about the restaurant is very important. And how long they've been, really how long they've been open is the most important thing. Restaurants that just open tomorrow and then they're telling everybody they want to buy local, you got to be really careful with them. And generally with those ones, you want them to pay you cash. You don't want to go into terms with those types of restaurants. Because restaurants are the most notorious types of businesses for not paying their bills. And they often, 85% of them tank in the first year. And the only people that get paid when they go bankrupt is usually the bank and the government. Everybody else gets jacked. So you have to be careful with how you manage your money with restaurants. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later when we get into accounting software and managing your accounts and things like this. So why do you want to sell to these guys and why should they buy from you? This is a really important thing to understand when you, even you're making your pitch. Because if you don't even think you like that restaurant, it's going to be harder to be sincere. And my whole approach with business and farming is I want to be sincere. Because I'm not sincere. I'm not selling plasma TVs. right? I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you something that you, I know you don't need. I'm trying to work with you because I think that I, we share values and we, we speak a common language. And that's really a, a, a good foundation to build in a relationship or in, in business, any kind of business agreement. So why, why should they buy your stuff? What is it about your product that is going to service them? So going through this list up here, learning things about that restaurant is going to give you a, a way better way to craft your story and craft your language when you go to them. And, it's, and this isn't about fibbing. This isn't about exaggerating. It's about being totally sincere, but making sure that that restaurant shares your values so that you can go in there and be sincere. If they're a restaurant that's using baby vegetables, which is becoming very common in, in culinary, and in the, the workshop tomorrow we go through a whole list of plates and food and how things are plated and how chefs are using them, but knowing about how they use stuff really helps you create better product for them to use because you know their language. You understand what they're doing. Look at, look at their menus. Learn about the kind of products they're using and, and what, what's, what, how often do they change their menu? Is there seasonality to their menu? Pretty much all field to fork restaurants will change their menus four times a season, depending on where they are in the world, some places more than others. Generally speaking, the really big, high-end, Michelin-star type restaurants will have less menu changes than the small owner-operator types. Because the owner-operator type restaurant who's just got a few people in the kitchen and a couple servers, they can change their menu on a fly. They don't really have to educate all this line of command on how to change it. They can just do it if there's less stuff this week for this particular product and more stuff the next week, it doesn't really matter. But the big, big restaurants, that there might be 70, 30 to 70 people in a kitchen, they can't do that. There's a whole line of command that needs to know exactly how things are plated and what's, what's going on there. So you have to know what you're getting into and how you can best cater to them. So really understand what your, what your value proposition is and so that you can articulate best to them most effectively. I think I said this the other day, but w what I say to restaurants when I go in to meet a new chef, I'm not there to give them a spiel on the pedal-powered aspect of my farm, even the urban aspect of my farm, my, my, my value proposition to them is, we're a small farm, we grow small veg. In, in, in one sentence, I can say that, and they, that means a lot to them. This is what we do. We do small tomatoes, cherries and saladettes. We do small baby root vegetables, baby carrots, 
turnips, baby beets, radishes. We do baby salad mix. We do microgreens. We do baby courgettes, patty pans and baby zucchinis. I can really quickly just articulate to them, this is what we offer. That's really important when you're, when you're getting to know chefs because they're busy people and they're not going to have tons of time to just shoot the breeze with you. They want to hear what you can do for them and then, then leave it at that. And then you might follow up with fresh sheets or sample products, things like that afterwards. But keep your initial uh, meeting with that person brief and, and all about a value proposition as to what you can bring them. So this is really important. This is an easy way to figure out if a restaurant is solvent or not. So you can do all kinds of other research, but this one is really easy. Just go there at various different times of the week and see how busy they are. Generally, just like anything in business, the more stable you are with your, with your customers, day to day, afternoon to evening, morning to evening, whatever it is, generally the more solvent you're going to be. That means you've got enough steady income coming in consistently so that you can pay your expenses. If you go into a restaurant and they're absolutely dead on a Monday, they're dead on a Tuesday, dead on a Wednesday, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday they're busy, that can be telling. Because the thing with a restaurant is they are expensive to operate. You've got staff, you've got your rent or your lease, you've got all the machinery and equipment you're using that has utility expenses, you've got all kinds of occupational licensing and regulations that you have to go through. Having a restaurant just open even if there's just a couple people working there, is very expensive. Some of the smallest restaurants I know, that I'm, I'm, and I'm talking they've got 15 tables in there, 15 tables too, so they can have 30 people in the restaurant, they need $1,000 a day just to break even, just to pay their staff and pay the, themselves a very minimal wage. So this is the kind of revenue we're talking about. You can almost just guess. If you look at a restaurant and you go in there, and you look at the plates and say you've looked at the menu before, you can almost quantify what the restaurant's bringing in. Say so you've got, so there's, 10 pe there's 10 people in there, everybody's got an entree, let's say it's a $20 entree, that's $40 a table, okay? So that means they're making $400. How long are those people going to sit there? An hour? Okay, maybe they're making $400 an hour. Okay, that's a metric. That's something you can use to understand and guess where they're at. Because so many people get burned with restaurants, and I've been, very, I've been burned myself with them, because I didn't do this kind of preliminary market research. I didn't really know what I was getting into. But when you're selling to chefs, you really need to know what to do. And the more consistent they are, the better you're going to be. So I've got a, a breakfast restaurant I sell to. Every single day, they have a lineup every morning. They only do breakfast. So that's a really great customer because... They're closed for the rest of the day. When they're open, they're full every single day of the week. That's great. That's a really good sign. But then if you see these other places that are fluctuating and there's not even consistency to that fluctuation, that tells you something too. If, if a place is always packed Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and maybe they're somewhat steady during the week, that might be okay. But if you go in there on a Saturday night when you think they should be busy and they're absolutely dead, that can tell you a lot of things. It can tell you that they might not be doing, running the best kind of business because restaurants are so risky. My, my dad um, ran a restaurant when I was a kid. It was my first job. I worked as a dishwasher in his restaurant. And he would always say to me, he said, Curtis, you're only as good as your last meal. So the last person that walked out of your restaurant, if they were pissed off about what they had, that's going to be a ripple effect, and that could affect your sales the next day. They could leave there and tell 10 people that they had a horrible experience at your restaurant, and it can affect you very, very quickly. So there's a lot of things you can learn just by watching these. Probably the most important thing with restaurants, absolutely most important thing is, do they pay their bills? Do they actually settle up with the people they owe money to? An easy way to find this out is if you get to know other people that are selling to those restaurants, just asking other farmers straight up. Make sure you know those farmers well enough, but I think farmers in, in small areas should know each other. We should kind of try to cooperate as much as we can, and we've had this in, in my town, Kelowna. All the growers know each other, and we all share information with each other all the time. I'll get a call sometimes, hey, have you got a check from so-and-so recently? 
you know what? Let me look at my, let me look at my book. I don't think I have, actually. I haven't got to check from those guys in three weeks. Huh, what's going on there? Let's, let's, let's check out with John. What does he say? Oh, John didn't get a check either. Hmm, okay. This kind of stuff is important because they can go, a restaurant can go down very quickly. It can be a sort of a chain reaction, a domino effect where you notice that they, they're not paying a couple people here and there. So you might know one farmer who's not getting paid, but you're getting paid. And then you hear of another farmer not getting paid. So now you want to start being careful. Maybe you start saying, okay, I'm, we're going we're gonna to go COD now. You know, you, you, can, you can change things around. And I've done that. I've had customers that were on terms for a year, but they consistently were late on their payments. And every time I wanted to get paid, I had to phone them, email them, sometimes go down there and hustle them to get paid. There was one customer last year, I did this an entire year, so in a year of 2014. Every time I got paid, I had to go in there, and I got tired of it. And so the next year, I just stopped calling them. They, they hadn't even settled up. This was going into April the next year. They hadn't even settled up invoices from November. They only owed me a few hundred bucks, so at that point, I was just not worried about it. I don't care because I'm just tired of dealing with it. Then they, they hired a new manager who was a personal friend of mine, and she says to me, hey, how come you're not delivering stuff to us? I'm like, well, because you guys don't pay your bills. I, can't, I don't have time to chase you down for money. And they said, well, we really want to get stuff from you. I'm like, okay, you can get stuff from me again, but you got to be COD. If you can pay me cash on delivery, no problem. Then they, they changed to that, and it was fine. So you sometimes change things as you go, but I find the key is just to be honest. You know, you don't have to get into a yelling match with a chef if they haven't paid you, but just to be forthcoming and say, look, guys, I'm, I'm literally spending five hours every two weeks trying to chase you down for money. I just don't have that time. I'm a farmer. I'm in the field. I don't have time to chase you down. So if we could just go to COD, everybody wins. I just deliver stuff, you pay me, and then we're done. So that will make things a lot easier for you. So before we carry on, I think we should just... Do uh, you guys want to... Takes, do you have any questions so far? Do you want to throw questions at me? Okay, yeah, go for it. Do you charge for terms? Do you like say, I'll take you on terms, but I don't want to use it. Yeah, so, so the question was, can you charge on terms by a adding an uh, amount per week? You can do whatever you want. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. The way, I, the way I do it is if they're late, then they, they pay penalties. They pay percentages. So my accounting software actually just does that automatically. If I issue a statement, and we'll, we'll look at that near the end of the session. When I issue a statement and it says this invoice at this date, this invoice at this date, this one's like two months old, it's got 15% added to it. I'll do that, but I don't personally charge for terms. What my approach for terms is that if you want to go on terms, you first have to be doing a decent amount of volume. Like we're talking... Anything over 200, you got to be order, ordering well over $200 a week to be on terms. And you've got to have a good history of paying me. So my, my policy now is if you're a new restaurant, you start on COD. And if we do that for a year and you've proven that you can handle it, I'll go on terms. Or I'll go on terms if, the, if I know the restaurant's been open for 10 years and they're totally solvent based on some of the research we talked about here, they can go on terms. But um, I only do it with places that are, that are doing big orders and have a really good long-standing reputation and, and credit. You can even get a, go to a bank and get a credit approval form. You can say, yeah, you can go on terms, fill out this credit approval form. That gives me consent by you to check your credit. You can do this. This is available to any business. Everybody else, like all their, if, you, if you're, if you're a, a car salesman or any type of salesperson that's going to finance people or put people in terms, you can get those credit applications. So check, check those out. Um, we sell a lot of microgreens, and we have some restaurants that buy only microgreens from us. And I had one in particular that they did pay COD. Um, I was delivering twice a week to them, and it was on a pretty busy delivery route. And I actually found it more frustrating to find someone there who, who was authorized to pull cash out of the register and I'd have to wait around with my truck running. And I actually, I, I went on terms with them because I just wanted to drop the product, drop and the get product, out. and get out of Yeah. There. So how would you rephrase that as a question if you were in my situation? I don't know how to uh, rephrase I, that. I, 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 I would say, have you encountered situations like that where COD actually is more pain in the 
right now. Yeah, yeah. So have, have I encountered situations where COD is a pain because you show up and they, it, it takes a half an hour for somebody to go to the till? Yeah, absolutely. But um, some sneaky people do that intentionally. They'll do that intentionally. I, this one, I've, I've sold to so many different restaurants, but there was this one restaurant that did that every time. They kind of screwed me around every time I showed up just so I'd be like, okay, you know what? Just sign the invoice. I'll see you later. And then they don't pay you. So yes, I've seen that. Um, I mean, it's sort of just a character read to figure out if you think they're BSing you or not, kind of just taking you for a ride. Um, so yeah, definitely. And that's generally why the bigger restaurants I do on terms, because I go into some kitchens where there's 10 line cooks, the executive chef's in an office, the executive shoe chef, chef, chef is over there, there's four dishwashers, it's huge. And, you know, if you want to get paid there, it's really inconvenient because they got to get somebody to go to the till. You know, they, 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 most of them won't do it, yeah. right, unless they're small orders. Because I have some restaurants that I'm literally bringing $1,000 of product to at once. They can't, they can't pull that out of the till. Yeah. So it's just, it just depends on the context of the restaurant, really, how big their orders are and, and how much faith you have that they're going to pay their bills. The easiest way to put somebody on terms, if you don't want to go into... Because I have some restaurants that are 21-day terms, some restaurants that are 30-day terms. I have some, one of my big distributors that I sell to is on 45-day terms. He's only on that because he, he buys a ton of stuff from me and he's been solvent for years. So I trust him, but I wouldn't do that normally. The easiest way to go on terms with people is just they settle the last invoice when they sh we show up the next week. That's the easiest way to do it. And then that, that takes the least amount of paperwork and monitoring on your end. So every time you show up the next week, they've got a check for you from last week's invoice because they can only burn you once, right? And then you, you kind of just, okay, I'm not delivering until you set up the next invoice. That way you kind of shelter yourself from it. What, one more question about being the one-stop shop. We do have a couple restaurants where we are a one-stop shop with them, but not from our own products. It's because we're buying products from a lot of other farmers or, um, well, yeah, yeah, mostly other farmers, you know, some small local so yeah, you're asking about you know if you're a one-stop shop, um, are, you, are you essentially asking me that it, it, to buy product from other farmers and then and sell it to them? Because I do that, I do the same thing. Yeah, basically, I, I guess I'm saying, um, could you see there being an advantage to doing that? Yes. That you can see what sells. Absolutely. And There's a huge advantage to that. Absolutely. I I, I would ra so I do the exact same thing. I have about four other growers that I buy stuff from. If I'm short on one particular thing, like I've got a guy who will always top me up on radishes and beets and carrots. I've got another guy who will sometimes top me up on spinach and some other greens. I don't have anybody that can make greens as good as me, so I don't have anybody that tops me up that way. But some of these other products, even tomatoes sometimes, yeah, because, well, for one, you're keeping the sales channel go through, going through you, you might not even make barely a markup on the product, but that's not the value of it. The value for you is that you are that channel for them that's dependable. So you know, you're, try, you're kind of trying to be a one-stop shop, but don't, don't get too hung up on sometimes if you can't make an order. This is why it's, like, when we look at sheets, we'll talk about how we f assess the field and all this, but it's always important to understand what you've got coming off your field, foresight, so that if a chef calls you on Monday to figure out what you might have for Friday, you can tell them what you think you're going to have. You, and, and, and so sometimes that might just mean, oh yeah, we've got a lot of this because I know I can get some from my friend Bruce or something like that. You know? so, but at the same time, you might just have to be honest and say, no, because they, sometimes they'll, if they're steadily getting something like 20 pounds of arugula a week and all of a sudden they want 50, you know, for you to say in that case, I won't have that, but I will have your standing order. That's not a bad thing. And, and, and you know, keep in mind that they are going to buy from other farmers. That's just, that's, they need to diversify just like you do. Yeah, so how, how do the logistics work out when they're ordering, how much buffer time you have? Um, so, well, I'll first address the last part of the question when you're talking about planning and planting. 
that's not based on what I think they're going to order. That's based on when I, when my overall sales from the previous year, what I think I can sell. That's how I structure my farm. And we'll look at a couple sheets there that get more into that. But as far as week to week, uh, it's on my fresh sheet. It'll say, if, you're order, if you want a delivery on Friday, then you got to have your order in by Thursday morning. G that's generally how it is. But when, when things start to get tight in the summer, when there's restaurants are really busy and we're moving a lot of product and there's a ton of demand, some chefs will call me on Sunday night to, to, make, to make sure they have a foot in the door for a certain product for Friday delivery. So it's a, it, it can be wherever, depending on the time of the season. But generally, it's just what's on my fresh sheet. If, you're, if I'm delivering Friday, I need your order by Thursday morning. And, it, and I say right on there, everything is first come, first serve. If you place your order on Tuesday, then you're going to get that order. But you know, honestly, I do play favorites, though. I will play favorites. I generally will favor my long-term customers. They'll always get priority. So even if a chef I've been working with for six years places his order on Thursday morning and even a new, and a new chef placed on Wednesday morning, I will favor the, 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 the long-standing customer. That's just, that's just the way I do it. I'm not saying that you guys need to do it that way. It's up to you how you manage your business. But, but I do play favorites that way. Basically, from my end, I've got about 20 different restaurants that I'll sell to at any given week throughout the season. But there's really about seven that have supported me from the beginning, and I will almost bend over backwards for them because they take up 80% of the income of my restaurant revenues. Scott? Minimum yeah, I, my minimum order for downtown is 100 bucks, and if it's out of downtown, so if it's you know, a couple miles away or more, then it's gonna be 200. But I always put that on my fresh sheet, and we'll, we'll look at a sample of it too, you'll, you'll see it. I don't charge a delivery fee, no, because, th and that's where the minimum order thing comes in. Okay. Um, you know, the minimum order thing, too, is kind of, if I, if I have a group of restaurants to deliver to downtown, which is usually where I do most of my deliveries, like, we'll do that by bike. We'll go downtown, and we can hit up seven places in half an hour. If somebody's en route, and they want a small order, like, say they only want to start with $50 of stuff, if I can go in and out of there really quick, all to take on a new customer and build up that relationship, I will offer that service. But if somebody says, I'm five miles out of town and I only want 50 bucks of stuff, it's like, just come to the farmer's market. That's the easiest way to do it. That's sometimes the best way to build up good relationships with chefs is just kind of give them a little bit more carefree or relaxed way to purchase from you. Just show up at the market. And then that way they're, they're forced to pay cash. And that way they get their stuff, they're happy, and then you don't have to worry about coordinating deliveries or anything like that. It's both. Yeah, so he was asking how far my delivery radius is and if, uh, if I'm approaching new restaurants or they're approaching me. It's both. It's mostly them approaching me now because I can continue to operate for years to come just on my core base. I'm not really looking to expand my farm much anymore. I'm, I'm satisfied with where it is. And, um, but if I do hear of a, of a new restaurant coming into town, I'll wait a bit to approach them, but they're often approaching me because I, I sell to about four or five of the top chefs in my area. So they, when a new chef comes to town and opens a new restaurant, the first thing they're doing is at looking at the best chefs and figuring out where they get their stuff and what they're doing. That's just, they're doing market research just like we're going to do market research. So usually they're coming to me and, um, but yes, there's sometimes I'm knocking on doors, more, more so in the past when I was getting established. But, you know, that's, that's what you got to do when you're starting out. You're going to knock on doors. you got to make that value proposition and do all your market research beforehand. Yeah, just. Uh, you said you have a lot of your crops planned out from previous year's sales. How much do you let uh, some of your chef, chefs dictate uh, what you're going to put in the ground? Say, hey, I really want to try out this new menu or uh, this new dish. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You grow this for me, but then they say, hey, it didn't work out. You know, are you stuck with having bought seed or planted the crop? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, so Jesse's asking... What, how much do I customize my farm plan based on what chefs want me to do? Am I, am I planting stuff specifically for some chefs? 
yes and no. I do it for, if I've known a chef for years and, and she says, okay, can you do, I want just some of these like, you know, baby, baby um, peppers that I did this for one chef this year, uh, just for pickling for a certain time of the season. Yeah, okay. If I, if I can plant it in an area that's like not prime real estate, I'll do that. I'll do things in small volumes for things that I, for chefs that I know. And it's a crop that I think is economically worth it. Some people might say to me, hey, can you grow me giant eggplants? It's like, no, that just doesn't fit my farm model. From my end, it's like if anything goes under what I said earlier, the small veg or micro type thing, the baby greens, I'll try all kinds of stuff. And I'm always willing to take feedback and hear requests from them. But it's really just an assessment of what kind of value am I going to get out of that. But if I can do things in an odds and ends area and experiment, which I always do, we're constantly doing R&D on our farm. Like every year we try new crops, we'll try a few of, the, but we do it in small isolated um, ways so we're not taking huge risks. We're just kind of uh, reducing our exposure. We'll just do small amounts and, and see what they like. That's a really good question. So do we discuss the price beforehand when going into those kind of negotiations? Um, no, because sometimes you don't know what it's worth until you grow it. And that's a whole other thing of it's better to under, um, it's better to under promise and over deliver than to over promise. Because I have done that in the past. I've said, okay, I'll grow this and I think I can sell it at this based on what I look at other organic farmers are selling it for. And then I grow this thing and I'm like, that's not worth that price. And then I, I come up asking for double what I promised as a price, and then they're not happy about it. So I think it's better to not really get into it. If they specifically want to know, then maybe go on a ballpark, but you know, kind of reiterate to them that there's no guarantee I can do it at this price. Having said all that, this kind of thing isn't going to be your bread and butter. These kind of negotiations and these kind of situations are going to be far from your bread and butter. There are going to be things that are just little garnishes and top, top ups here and there. Your bread and butter is going to come from your prime real estate on your farm, your core group of crops. That's what you're going to do 80% or more of your time on and what you're going to be selling. Everything else is kind of just little additions here and there. So don't get too hung up on those things. Yeah, Jesse. Okay, so are you asking that if they're telling me they're not using certain products? If they're, like, if they're, they're telling you what it's used for and it's not something that, like, uh, it's actually being eaten, it's just like a garnish. Oh, it's a garnish, like, like a little parsley, like a, like a like, right. Um, I, don't, I don't put much real estate into that. Um, quite literally, the, in those situations, we're talking about six-foot bed chunks. And I, I do a lot of my herbs in that way. I'll do, like, six-foot chunks of cilantro. So I'll take a 25-foot bed, I'll do a six-foot uh, six chunk of cilantro, a six-foot chunk of parsley, and then I'll do another cilantro and parsley in succession. I might make a 25-foot bed that way. So just small chunks. Sometimes it will be herbs that are interplanted amongst tomatoes or along the edge of the fence or in some sort of odds and ends area. I do those things, or even spring onions. I do, I do spring onions here and there. They're not a very profitable crop. They are, as far as all the other aspects that make a profitable crop on my farm, it's just they take so long to wash that they become barely economical, but I still do them so that at my farmer's market, I can have 10 bunches of them. So they don't take up prime real estate. They're sometimes interplanted. They're just, I'm always thinking about what's my prime real estate. That's my bread and butter. Everything else is corners, odds and ends, little chunks here and there. That makes sense. Have you ever uh, gone up to one of your better chefs and they wanted a specialty vegetable, fairly soon for some special recipe, and you've actually been their shopper for them, and then they just barked up accordingly? No. So the, the, no, I don't have time to do that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a it could be a niche. Um, 
I mean, that's an interesting question because you're kind of going on the whole idea of being a broker. So I, I do that. I, I did that in a CSA one year. I, was, I had eight growers that I, I was um, sourcing from as well as selling my own stuff. So there, there might be a, a market for that, but uh, especially when you're starting, actually. Especially when you have less product, you might find an, uh, an opportunity to be helping get other growers stuff out there while kind of piggybacking your stuff on there, too. It is. Brilliant. Yeah, it, 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 it sounds like a great way to transition. And then you can, you can learn a lot about the marketplace, too, without actually growing the stuff yourself. You can, it's kind of, it sounds like a cool model. Okay, either way, let's carry on. We'll, we'll have questions again. So there's sort of the top end information that's the most important information to track, and then there's things that are less important. But tracking is, is, is really important in general. So there's sort of three things we're looking at when we're talking about tracking information. Essentially, what goes in? So what are your, your, your field costs? Like what goes into the field as far as what did you plant in the field? What are your input costs? What did you spend on compost and fertilizer? What, how much did you spend on labor? How much did you spend on materials, irrigation, uh, biofilm or you know landscape fabric or mulch or any of that what goes in tracking all that stuff is really important the next one is what comes off the field and so there's going to be a bunch of different sheets for all of these what comes off the field what comes out so what was harvested also what was ordered and then what was delivered so this these two things are a a reduction of one another so what did a restaurant order and then what did I deliver them? The difference is the short. You want to track your shortages. You don't want to short people, um, but you want to track where you are short. So on my farm, because I, I will broker from other growers when I'm short, I'll still track the short. So if, I, if somebody says, I want six cases of radish, and I only had five of my own to deliver, and I, that means I was one short, even if I sourced that from another grower, I'm still going to track that I, I was short, because I want to know next year for my production plan that I might increase my radish plantings at that time of year. So in tracking all this stuff is really important. So there is a difference between what's ordered, what's delivered. There's also a difference from what was harvested and then what was, what was delivered. So the difference is your spoilage, right? So the, the, diff the shortage difference is what was ordered, what was delivered. The difference is the shortage. The, the spoilage difference is what did you pull off the field versus what, you, what was ordered. The difference is what went in the compost pile. Recording that is important because it tells you what you're overproducing. You're producing too much of something. But it can also be a tax write-off too. It's different in every jurisdiction, so I don't want to say you can do that for sure because I don't know in California. But restaurants claim spoilage. Right? Everything that they throw out gets claimed as a write-off. It's an expense. So we, we claim spoilage on our farm. If, if, we, if we had, you know, one year, we had $20,000 of spoilage, we wrote that off. That was when our farm was huge. I had two and a half acres. We had $20,000 of spoilage. That's a write-off, right? So these are just what any good accountant is going to tell you. Try to find all these different ways to write these things off. But again, be careful with it. Make sure you check out your tax jurisdiction and if that's possible, because it might not be. I know even in Canada, there's some places that that's not allowed. So check that out and it might save you some money. The third thing is, what needs to get done on a day-to-day -day basis? So what are you going to harvest each week? What are your weekly to-dos? What are some projects that need to get done or what, what you have as ideas for the next season? So these are things that we're going to update constantly, and uh, we can track them, we can put them on lists, and we'll check that out. So this is my most used tool on my farm. I use this more than my stirrup hoe, I use it more than a greens harvester, I use it more than my BCS walk-behind rototiller. Smartphone is the most used tool on my farm. Every single time I go to a plot, I'm taking pictures, I'm making notes, I'm always recording information. So I've just created habits to doing this. And essentially, the smartphone has just replaced the journal. Because when I first started, one of my first mentors was, a, was an organic seed saver named John Elcock. 
And he said, you got to keep a journal with you all the time and always record what's happening on your farm. And that's good advice. Problem was, my hands were always dirty and my handwriting sucks. So when it came time to actually flip through this thing in the winter and try to figure out, what was that thing I did about carrots? What happened there? Flipping through it and I can't find it. And so I wasted probably dozens of hours of time trying to navigate my journal. So the smartphone, the technology we're going to look at is what allows you to leverage all of that information. Because like I said at the beginning, information is like seeds. You must harvest it, clean it, sort it in order for it to be useful. That's what the spreadsheets allow you to do, whereas in the journal you can't do that as much. But the smartphone in my situation is my first interface between what's happening now and what will get logged into the computer. So these are things like calendar reminders. I, I use Siri on my iPhone for everything. I'll go in, I'll click it, and I'll say, add to calendar. Do this at this time. Remind me when I get home to do this. I use this constantly. As soon as something comes to my mind, I put it in here so that I don't forget. Because that's the thing on a farm is there's so many things happening at once sometimes. You can just get overwhelmed with all the little things. You'll always remember the big things, you know, an irrigation line blew somewhere, so you got to go fix that. But what about all those little things? Oh, you forgot you were going to thin something out or you were going to turn over a couple beds. All these little things, if you don't create habits for them, to, for recording this information, it won't get done. So I'm constantly adding stuff to my calendar. And every week, at the beginning of the week, I look at my calendar. What are the major things that need to get done this week outside of what is on our normal schedule? So if everything goes well on an average week on our farm, Monday through Friday, we're doing bed prep and planting on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday and Thursday, we're harvesting. Friday, we're portioning and packing and delivering. And Saturday, at the farmer's market, Sunday, we have off. If everything goes well, that's our week. But where, you know, okay, we've got to, we got to install irrigation at this new site. Okay, we're going to go, we got to go rototill to turn over a new plot of land. You're always going to have these big kind of boulder things that you've got to push along. So if you're not using a calendar, it's going to be hard to allocate time for that. And... This is why when I was starting out on my farm, I also used my phone to record all the tasks I did on the farm. This sounds totally methodical, I understand. But it will tell you a lot about how you can plan your week. Because if you don't know how long a certain task takes, then how do you structure your week? So for a period of time, I used to have a, I would have a clipboard with me with a bunch of different tasks. And as I, as I would do it, I would just hit the, I would just, okay, I'm going to go harvest the better greens or I'm going to harvest a bed of radishes by hand, let's say, because harvesting greens now is really fast for us with a greens harvester. But I just set the stopwatch on my phone, start, harvest that bed of radishes, track how long that takes you, and then make notes of these things. Put these things into your spreadsheets. When we look at the, the yields sheets that we're going to see up here, you'll see that there's always little note patterns on there on how I can keep tracking this information. But if you, if you know how long it takes you to do something, you can guess how long it'll take somebody else to do it. Generally speaking, I find whatever time it takes you to do something, an employee will take tw at least 25% longer to do it than you will because nobody usually will work as hard as you as the business owner. So always tack on a little bit more time for that. If you say, okay, I can harvest a bed of radishes in 45 minutes, assume that if you send somebody out to do that, it might take them an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Depends how new they are. Depends how experienced they are. But if you don't have a list of uh, expectations of how long things take on your farm, you don't know how to plan your week. And this is really important because I know, I look at my calendar every Monday morning and I know I need to have a certain amount of time available to harvest root vegetables, harvest greens, pack those greens, deliver to restaurants. I've got basically static blocks in my calendar that are things that have to get done no matter what. Then it's trying to figure out where do you put in all the other things that you have to do? Where do you find time for those? And if you don't know how long the static and steady things that you do take, then how are you going to figure out how, everything else, how long everything else is going to take? So that helps you with delegating. So to-do lists is something that we're constantly updating. I actually use a Google Doc now on my phone. It's a to-do list that is shared by anybody on the farm. So everybody has access to that doc. And when I'm out looking at things, I'll add tasks to that document. I might put them on the top or I might put them on the bottom, depending on how important they are. But I'll say, you know, it might be something priority in all bold. This is priority. This needs to get done. 
and then we'll have a, another column on there that says, who did it? What time was it done? That way I know where we're at. I don't have to go out and check in with everybody. I can just look at this sheet and figure out where we're at with it. And the other thing I'm using for my phone is adding items to my spreadsheets. So like I said, this is my most used tool. I'm out of plot. I might make a voice memo, take a photo, make a video, consistently recording things that I basically record into Evernote. So this is a program, it's free. There's other programs that do the same thing. I like Evernote because it syncs the Evernote app on my phone, it synced to my computer. So when I'm out on the field, so this is just like a weekly harvest note for me. I can actually use the voice memo on my phone, my phone with the Siri app or the Siri program on the iPhone. I can, I can say this stuff. I can go arugula, bed five, Lawrence, comma, 20 pounds. Enter, enter. Spinach, bed eight, Lawrence, comma, 35 pounds. I will literally speak that into my phone. And then when I, when I come home, it's all right there. It's almost just cut and pasting it into my spreadsheets. But you got to have systems for it. So the first step of the system is constantly record everything. Data is so, like, space is so cheap now. You know, iPhones, this is like a 64 gig iPhone. I don't really have to worry about maxing out my phone on information. So you might as well record as much as you can. But you want to record the top end information, and we'll, we'll look at that shortly. But so every time I'm out harvesting, I'm, I'm recording this as it happens. I'll have a scale with me. I'll have my Rubbermaid totes there. I'm harvesting what, uh, recording what I harvested. That goes on the phone. And then every Tuesday and Friday, I spend a half an hour before the end of the day recording that information. So you want to get into a habit of doing office work as part of your farm work. You don't want to make the mistake that most farmers do, which I made many times, is that you do all the data entry when everybody else goes home. And that means you're sitting on the computer for sometimes hours. You want to schedule that into your day. If you want a balanced quality of life, make sure that you do that because otherwise you're always going to be spending extra time. So for myself, Tuesdays at 4.30, fr Fridays at 4.30. I spend a half an hour logging this stuff in. So at the end of Tuesday, I'm logging in everything that was planted, all the beds that were turned over. At the end of Friday, I'm recording what was harvested throughout the week. And consistently doing that gets you stuff like this. And we're going to look at this in, in further detail. But this is my yield sheet. How much did I pull off? I can sort it by crop. Arugula. What did I, what did I harvest off all of those beds of arugula this season? This kind of information is very telling because it'll tell you where your benchmarks are. What are your standards? What can you learn to depend on? Because, I mean, I've got examples of it in my book. I'll tell you, uh, average bed of arugula, 25 foot by 30 inches, I can get 20 pounds off. But that's a benchmark. You know, Eric Schultz here in, in uh, Arizona might have a different benchmark. He might have something that's totally a different experience because he's in a hotter climate. He might have to plant it at a wider density or a tighter density. It depends. So the only way you can really figure out where you're at is by recording this information. And that's how I've come to all the stuff that's in my book is because I've spent years doing this. But it sets up expectations because you'll see patterns in this information, and we'll talk more about that coming up, but you'll see patterns with things like arugula. You'll, you'll, you might notice that you get higher yields in the spring, you get lower yields and less cuts in the summer, and you get more yield in the fall. You might notice those patterns. And that'll allow you to plan accordingly and set up your expectations better. So you know what's going to be coming off your field. That allows you to speak language when you're talking to chefs so that you know what to expect. So you don't have to worry about over-promising and under-delivering. You can consistently over-deliver. That's, that's where you want to be. So it's the same thing with planting. Every time I'm out in the field and I'm turning over beds and I'm planting, I'll literally sail the stuff into my phone. July 5th, Lawrence, Radish, EE, -E, which means Easter egg, bed five. I'll just lay all that stuff out so that when I come home and I'm back on my computer, I'm just putting it in, da -da -da, typing it in real quick. It, does, it barely takes me any time. But once you have to create a habit for it, if you don't create a habit, it won't get done. So that's my planting sheet. And again, there's so much information. We'll look at this one closer later on. And these, these are tough things to put on a, on a projection screen, right? It's like, how much can you actually get of that? 
But when we look at it closer, we'll go through the parts and not have this on the screen so long. But all this information tells me so much about what I can expect. If I record my planting dates for every single crop on my field, and I also record the date of emergence, which, which is referred to as the DOE. So how long did that seed take to germinate at each time of the year? When was the date to harvest? When did I harvest that crop at each time of the year? When was the, what was the average days to maturity? All those things will help you plan better and understand your system going forward. So why do we use spreadsheets? Well, it's because the journal just isn't that effective any longer. And the, the technology is there. We might as well use them. I would say pretty much everybody who has a computer has access to this stuff today. And there's very few people in, in Western society that don't have computers. So you might as well use this stuff because it will help you learn and double down on things that aren't working or are working and, and decrease the things that, that aren't. So the, the primary sheets that I'm using on a day-to-day -day basis on my farm are tracking my sales, tracking my plantings, and tracking my yields. There's some others we're going to look at too, but these are the ones that I use the most of. And so how these sheets are built is very important because you could track a lot more things on here than is necessary. And if you look at this sheet, it's an example of exactly that. You'll notice that on this sheet, just even if you can't even read the fields, you'll notice that these three fields here are filled out every time, and a lot of this stuff over here isn't. So I've got, I've got sample spreadsheets for all of you guys to take from my website, but understand that there's some things that are really important to track and other things that aren't as important. Sometimes if you think you want to add a certain field and you only add, you record something of that in that field every now and then, you're better off just recording that in a notes column. So I always have a notes column on all my spreadsheets, and if it's something that's anomalous, then I'll just put it in there. You don't necessarily have to have a field. Because if, if your sheets get too nebulous and there's way too many fields, it, it, it's kind of overwhelming. And, you're not, and, and, and it's not going to be as inviting to be adding information to that all the time. It's going to seem kind of overwhelming. Whereas if you have a really simple sheet that has six fields and it's just like bang, 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 you know what goes in all those things, it'll be more inviting and you'll create better habits to, to use them consistently. So those are our main things, sales, planting, yields. We're going to look at all of them specifically. These ones, we'll look at some of them. We're only going to have time to look at our spoilage expenses, but the other things, tracking your budget, expenses, your seed order, your labor. Um, seed order, spoilage, budget, expenses, all that stuff's in my book, all with those spreadsheets. So these things are still important, but they're not as critical as the field information, the sales information, and the, the yielding information, because that's the stuff that really allows you to leverage your abilities in your farm. So we also have shared sheets. This isn't a picture of a Google Doc, but we have a Google Doc that anybody who's working for me puts their hours into, so that's all there. I actually will copy that into my home office spreadsheet at some point. I know that sounds a little bit inefficient, but I do it just because sometimes Google Sheets can get messed up, and if one person messes it up, then I don't even know what happened before. So I, I like to copy, I like to have hard copies of everything, just for my own purposes. So weekly tasks as well. I'll, I'll have a, a weekly sheet that says, this is everything that gets done this week. There's usually something static in there, like what's being planted, what's being harvested, and then there's going to be a to-do list that is constantly being updated. So Anytime somebody shows up on Monday morning to work for me, they already have a pretty good idea of what needs to get done. And writing things down when you're working with crew is very important because you can, you know, you get into the thing, this sort of game of telephone, when you're, somebody comes to work in the morning and then you give them a list, you're talking through a verbal list of things to do, they might only remember the last two things and forget the rest of it, and then at the end of the day, you're going, what did you do with all the other stuff? What happened? They're like, oh, I thought you just said this or that. So having it written down makes your life so much easier because it's all there. There's no debate or argument about what needs to get done and what didn't get done. So we track all that stuff. What's the task? What plot was it at? How long did it take? So it's, it's easy, and, and, it, and it helps leverage everything else going forward. So let's look at what we track in further detail. And maybe we'll take some questions after this, this part here too. So sales, 
there's a number of things that we track within sales. The first thing to point out about with your sales is in order to get sales, in order to track your sales, you need to have something to sell and you need to have that line of communication with the chefs you're working with on what you've got to offer. So that all comes down to the fresh sheet. The fresh sheet is something that goes out every Monday morning. It goes out at 9 a.m. no matter what, it goes out. I have it set to automatic. If I didn't update it, it'll just send out the same version as last week to say this is what we have. What I do with my fresh sheet is I'm compiling at the week, the, the, so as the week wraps up on Friday, I'm compiling all the information on my, on my phone that goes into my spreadsheet of what I think I'm going to have the next week. So how many beds of radishes do I think I'm going to have available? Just looking at how many beds of greens I've got. Try to come up with a rough ass assessment of what I think will be ready the next week. That's what goes into my fresh sheet. That's what I talk to chefs about. That's what I plan to take to farmer's market. So you're constantly doing these assessments as a farmer. If you don't do them and you don't know, then you might get orders of stuff that you don't have. So you want to really be careful about how you build your fresh sheet. So again, this is available for free on the website. It's a sample. You can totally rip it off, put your logo on the top of it, do however you, use it however you like. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so this is a mobile-friendly fresh sheet, right? So that's why it's long and narrow like this. It fits perfectly on the mobile phone. Chefs use their phone. That way they can be in the, in the, on the line looking at what their kitchen staff are doing. They can go into their walk-in cooler with your fresh sheet, look at what they ordered last week, and they can, they'll, they'll just often text message me right there. They'll be looking in their walk-in cooler and say, okay, we need this, this, this. We've got this much of this left. It's easy for them. So try to make it as easy as you can uh, I'm actually developing an app right now with a guy in Montreal where we're making a fresh sheet that is going to be an order form as well. So you can send these guys a fresh sheet and then they can just push buttons on it and order. So that might be out in a, a year or so, maybe a year. So um, this goes out every week. It's consistent. It's mobile friendly. One really important thing about this fresh sheet is you only want to list what you know you have a lot of. If you've, if you've got... You've got, you, you, you say you think you've got 50 to 100 pounds of arugula coming next week, you've got 80 pounds of radishes, so on and so forth, but you've only, you, you know, you're short. You're, oh, I'm, I'm only going to have like three pounds of cilantro this week when normally you had 10. Don't list cilantro on your fresh sheet. Don't list the things on your fresh sheet that you know you're going to be short on. This is where I play favorites all the time, is if I have some chefs that are consistently ordering things and I might have enough to just meet their order, I'll just send them, send them a text message and just say, hey, I've got your cilantro this week, but it's not on the fresh sheet. I'll do that. Because if you list it and you don't have enough, there will be times where everybody will order it at once and then you're shorting everybody. You don't want to be in that situation. You're always going to be shorting somebody here or there. That's just the nature of this business. We can't consistently meet everybody's demands all the time, but you want to reduce your exposure to it so that you're, not, you're, you're, you're pissing off less chefs. So only list the things that you know you have a lot of and that you're absolutely confident that you can move big volumes in. All the little things where you're going to be short, don't list. You'll notice on here too, it's kind of hard to see, but if you get the, if you get the sample, you'll notice it closer, that everything I list on here is in a case lot. Not, not everything, some things are sold by the pounds, but generally what we're doing is we're selling a package deal of something. So just like at my farmer's market, I'm selling a $3 unit or two for five. I have a very simple mix and match pricing system. That makes it easy for people to calculate, make transactions, and just hand over larger groups of money because they're not thinking about what's the individual price, what's the package deal. Do the same thing with chefs. It's you're selling in case lots, so you're selling a box of salad mix. You're selling a case lot bag of radishes. You're selling a 10 pound flat of tomatoes. Things like that, bundling things together instead of selling things by the pound or by the unit. Because that's what they're used to anyways. They're buying all that stuff in case lots. When you look at the wholesale catalogs for big food distributors, that's what it is. You can't buy one bunch of this or one pound of that, you have to buy things by the case. So you do the same thing on here. So I, I have a, a, a generic $20 unit. For all of my greens, I have a $20 unit. 
arugula, 10 pound or a two pound bag of arugula is $20. Say a two and a half pound bag of spinach is $20. Could be a three pound bag of something is $20. It doesn't matter. You change the volume based on supply and demand, but keep the price the same. That way it's simple. They, they get the sheet, they just think, oh, $20 units, that's easy. So that's generally what I do. It. I'll do and, I'll, I'll, and I'll change the prices for certain things. So if you buy a two and a half pound, or say a two pound bag of spring mix for $20, I'll, send you a, I'll sell you a 10 pound box of spring mix for $80, right? So you, you incentivize larger purchases. And even outside of the fresh sheet, I have some customers that, I, that they operate outside of it. Like they're, they're gonna get their own deal. I have one customer that literally buys 100 pounds of salad mix a week from me. So he gets a special price. He gets a price that's not on the fresh sheet because he's, he's committing to buy volume. And I don't do contracts or anything with restaurants. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but it's kind of just a verbal. Like I have a lot of chefs that say, oh, I've got, I want a standing order of this every week. If I don't order, just show up with it. So we, we do those kind of things. You got to be careful with those too, but um, that's, that's what we're doing. We're doing things in bulk, we're doing things in volume, and we're disincentivizing smaller purchases and incentivizing larger purchases. So all of this is made on a program called MailChimp. There's other programs out there. There's one called Constant Contact. There's probably dozens of these programs. They just, they're email management programs. It's how you get lots of spam, basically. It comes through these programs. So that's one thing that's important, too, on a tech side of this, is you want to make sure they're getting your fresh sheet. Because sometimes you'll be sending it out and you won't be getting responses. Sometimes you should follow up. If you haven't heard from chefs, just phone them up and say, hey, are you getting the fresh sheet? Oh, no, it's, it's going to my spam box. Okay, make sure you unspam that so you get it. Sometimes you have to do that because they might not see it at all. Yeah? Do you mean you just use the service to send your fresh sheet out or you created your fresh sheet through MailChimp? I, the fresh sheet was created in MailChimp. No, no, but what I, that's a good question. He was asking if I text the fresh sheet. No, I don't, but what I do is every time I make my fresh sheet, there's a, there's a feature after it's been published, there's a, a button that says share, and it'll produce a little a web ULR link. I always copy that link onto my phone, so, and it's in my notes. It's, like, it's, it's in an Evernote. I always have like most recent fresh sheet in Evernote. So if for some reason a new chef that I'm talking to on the fly says, hey, can I see what's in your fresh sheet? I can, just, I can copy that link on my phone and text it to them, then they can open it up. Exactly, exactly. So that's, that's a good thing to do, for sure. So that's, so that's our fresh sheet. On the, uh, so we've got case lot units. I divide my, my products up by type. And then down on the bottom, I've got order cutoff time. So you can change this whatever you want it to be, right? However you're structuring your week, this is up to you. It'll just say, for me, it's, if you want to deliver for Friday, you need to have your order in by mon Monday at 9 p.m. And then there'll be some other stuff down there like minimum order. If you're downtown, you're $100. If you're out of downtown, $200. Phone number, email. And then I always put a disclaimer on the bottom that says everything is on a first come, first serve basis. Just set up expectations from the beginning. will make your life a lot easier. So that's the first part. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Jesse. No, no, no. I just on that, on that first come, first serve, what's your uh, communication with chefs if uh, you send out a fresh sheet, uh, a bunch of them order uh, the same thing, and then you realize immediately you're not going to be able to fulfill, how do you then get back to them, or how do you confirm, yes, you are going to get this, or something like that? Yeah, okay. So yeah, how, well, I mean, that, that's kind of going back to what I was saying about don't put things on there that you don't think you're going to have. But yeah, so, so Jesse is asking, you know, what do you do if it's the case where a bunch of people have ordered something you thought you might have had a lot of, but you realize you don't? It's not an easy thing to navigate. It's, it's really kind of playing favorites. Um, you know, it's, it's just, you got to just do the customer service thing. You know, you got to do the song and dance a little bit to be like, well, you know, we're, we're short. We had too many orders of this. I find just being honest and frank with chefs is the, is the best way to approach it, just to say, you know, sorry, we had too many orders. But like I said, I play favorites. So my first and longest term customers, they always get first dibs. Um, 
unless they are consistently being late or something, but they're usually going to get first dibs, and then I tell people that, you know, sorry, we're short. But here's a way you can avoid that altogether to some degree. This is what I do. When I take on new chefs, I only promise them things I know, so they won't even get the fresh sheet. If a new, if a new restaurant comes to me tomorrow and they want to start buying from me, I'll only promise them things I know I have a ton of. So for my, on my end, I can scale my greens production and microgreens production really quickly. Like in the summertime, I can start planting more greens, maybe reduce something else, and I've got a 21-day lag. You know, I can put arugula in the ground in the summer, 21 days I get the first harvest. So with the quick-growing, high-density crops, they have a lot of optionality in that way because you can constantly react and interact with what your production is. So when a new chef comes to me and says, hey, I would love to get your stuff, I'll, I'll say to them right off the bat, we're, we're totally maxed out right now. And this is a good, it's a good place to be in a situation of abundance where you're like, I'm sorry, we've got so much demand. All I can promise you is greens and I can do any kind of amount of microgreens you want. That way you just set up expectations right off the bat. And so they won't even get your fresh sheet. You, if you wanted, you could, make, you could make a, like say a second or alternative fresh sheet, but that, I don't think that'd be worth the work. So I did that for two or three customers this year. I said, all I can sell to you is spring mix. If you want spring mix, I got it. And then say to them, look, you know, if, if we're doing business for a long time and I can, I can start depending on you, then I can start integrating my production differently based on what your demands are. Kind of a follow-up on, on the fresh sheet is when you're saying you're selling as a case, do you give them a range of how the, 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 the weight? Yeah, it's on the fresh sheet. So it actually says five yeah. cases. Totally. Like it'll say, it, this says, it's hard, you can't see it here, but it says arugula, 20 pounds, two pound bag, okay. right? It's, it's all there. So, so they know, but it's just, they're, they're just used to getting these packages of things. Like they're not getting little bunches or pounds of, of this and that. Just a quick question. Do you confirm orders or not? Yes. Yep. So I do confirm orders. That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. So Thursday morning, orders start coming in on mass. I'm usually getting orders trickling in throughout the week. And then Thursday morning, I'll, I'll wake up and I'll get a bunch dumped in at once. And then there'll always be a couple that are late. So I'm following up and just saying, hey, didn't get your order. I'll usually will send them an email or text and just say, same order as last week, question mark. And most of the time they're saying, yes, okay, easy. Co copy and paste their last week order into this week's orders. Um, and they'll get a follow-up, yes, no problem, we'll have that. Sometimes it's a follow-up saying, hey, I've got all of this, but there's a chance I'm going to be short on these two things. This thing I definitely won't have. I was sold out earlier in the week. These things I might have. I'll, I'll, I'll give them a ballpark. And the best way to do this is to understand your field production. If you, and this is the challenge of selling to chefs, especially on a small farm, because if you don't, intimately know what's coming off your field and you've got conti people continuously ordering and asking and you're over promising then you're going to run into trouble really quickly this is where you can go to making a lot of money from restaurants to making no money from restaurants and then you're not getting any business so it's really all about just knowing your field production and that's what this is all about is just continuously updating with photos photos are the easiest way to do it when you're at a plot or a block anywhere in your land I take photos every single day so that I can just go back on them and just look at the field. Because instead of me going out into the field to check if what I have is available or not, I can just scroll, I can lay in bed and sleep in and look at my phone and just go, oh yeah, I've got tons of spinach here. Okay, there's arugula there. It's, it's just a lot easier, right? But it, it's just about intimately knowing what's coming on your production to, to be able to communicate that with, with chefs. Yeah, so the question was, do I, do I schedule a time of the day to do those orders? Yes. I, so I, Thursday morning, every, every Thursday morning, that's the first thing I do. I'm up, I, I start work at 7.30 and most, ti most times of the year, except for the summer, I'm up at 5.30. First thing I do, the guys that come into work, they already know what they're doing. They check the Google sheet on the way to work. They're already out doing stuff. I'm there finalizing the orders and taking all that stuff in. We're going to go through that process here. Um, but yeah, th that's, that's, part, that's usually the first hour of my morning is taking that stuff in, putting it in. If I didn't hear from one chef, I'm following up, sending them a text message, calling them. Did, did you, are you ordering? Is this the same as last week? Or whatever it is like that. So let's, let's look at this. So 
How, how do I receive orders? So I'm inputting information, I'm modifying that based on what, we're, what we harvest, and I'm calculating shortages or things that I'm, I might not have. So this stuff's either coming in the form of a text message, an email, or a phone call. So usually, like if it was a phone call, I put it in, in, into my notes. So sometimes I'm, I'm out in the field on a Wednesday, and we're doing some, we actually start harvesting before we get orders. You know, I'll, I'll get into that shortly here. But I'll be getting orders, and somebody will phone me. As soon as I get off the phone with them, I'll just go into my Evernote and just regurgitate that order back. Or I might ask them, would you mind texting that to me? Or would you mind emailing that to me? They'll usually do that. I like to have it in writing. That way there's no miscommunication of, of anything. So another spreadsheet. So um, again, we don't, don't worry about too much of the detail of the spreadsheet, but the important thing to understand here is that there's two parts. There's this part up top, which is orders past. So that's all of my orders from the beginning of the season to last week. This here, the one below it, is the current order sheet. That starts off every Monday empty. As I receive orders, they go in there. So as I get emails, text messages, and phone calls, those orders get inputted here. And the important thing here is that I can sort it. It's a separate sheet so that I can sort it to relay that information to a harvest tally. So what is going to go, what do I need to pull off the field? The orders that I get, the information of the specific orders, here's a restaurant, Rod's Regional Table, they want a case of beets, they want a case of carrots, they want a case of Tokyo turnips, they want a case of pea shoots, so on and so forth. When I'm out in the field, it's not important for me to know who ordered what. It's only important for me to know what is the total of all the products that I need to harvest. So the thing for us on our farm is we, we, we balance out our harvesting period. We don't do everything on Friday. A lot of farmers who don't have proper cold storage, they hammer everything out on Friday, they pack it, they portion it, they wash it, they do all that stuff, and then they deliver it the next day or they go to farmer's market. We don't do that because it's a recipe to burn out and the product doesn't last as long if you don't have a cooler. So you must have a walk-in cooler to do things the way that we do them. We harvest things when they're ready. So the strategy here is if a bed of something is ready, I want to harvest that entire bed because it's at its premium size. If that means I go out on a Monday and I see a bed of red Russian kale, baby red Russian kale is perfect size, I'm going to harvest that kale. Not only because it's at the right size and I can sell it as a premium product, but also it allows me to turn the bed over quicker. I'm always harvesting in units of beds. So my beds are standard 25, some are 50 feet long. We harvest entire bed units. When a bed of radishes is all mature, it gets cropped out and gets planted immediately. So that means sometimes I'm sitting on more radishes than I, than I know I can sell right away. But as I take you through this process, you'll see how this plays out. But the main reason is, is I would rather have a little bit of spoilage loss with the crop so that I can turn that entire bed over. Because if I go through and I just harvest the radishes that I need, say I've got a full bed that's ready, and, I've only, and I know I can get 80 bunches out of it, but I've, and, I, and I've only got orders for 50, if I go out and I harvest those 50 bunches, and then I leave the other 30 in there, next week they might be too big anyways, and then I've delayed planting that bed again for another week. So I would rather slightly sacrifice having a bit too much product so that I can replant that bed quick and that I have, so that I have consistency in my product. That's way more important to me. Did you want to ask something? Yeah, I do. Um, so let's take the radishes thing. Um, you're pulling radishes on Monday. Are these radishes ready to go on Monday? Are, yeah, the radishes I harvested on Monday, are they going to be on that fresh sheet? Yes. So what goes on the fresh sheet isn't what I've harvested. It's what I'm expecting to harvest based on what I see in the field. Yes, so on, usually on Friday, that's when I'm either going through photos that I took throughout the week, or if I'm at a plot, I'm making an assessment of what I see. It's not what I harvested. Though there's part of that I'll show you is a bit on what I harvested. We'll, we'll look at that in a second. So with this, what's happening is I'm, I'm receiving orders, and I'm putting these orders in here. And then, so this sheet is just what's on order this week. And now, like once I've gotten my orders, I'm going to sort this sheet 
by items. So I can sort it here by customers to see the orders in completion as they appear, or I can sort it by items, so I go alphabetically, arugula, beets, basil, so on and so forth, everything alphabetically. Do you have your hand up? Yeah. Okay, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll just I'll finish this thought, then I'll get to you. And then that correlates directly to my harvest tally. So this is another sheet that I take out in the field with me, and it's basically so that I'm out in the field, when I'm harvesting, I don't need to be thinking about, oh, Rods wants this, Waterfront Wines wants this. It, that's irrelevant to me. All I need to know is what is the total poundage of everything. So that's what this sheet is. This is, this is, my, well, this is my order sheet. So I've sorted it by items. Arugula, braising mix, kale, pea shoots, radish. It's all alphabetical. I'm going to make totals in there that correlate to this sheet. And this is what I take out in the field with me. I print this up every Thursday morning. It's and it, it, it's the, what is the total amounts of everything that we need to harvest, right? I don't need to know what all the orders were. So I'll go in here, arugula. So it's all sorted by items. I'll just take, here's total weight. Here's my total weight. Perhaps. I'll just take a, I'll grab those two and get the sum. And then I'll input that into this sheet. So what's my total order? Okay, I've got a total of 19 pounds of arugula on order. Because we harvest, sometimes, sometimes on a Monday, sometimes on a Tuesday, it depends on the weather, depends on how prime that crop is, there's going to be stuff in the cooler that's in stock. So we record that as well. We'll have a little sheet clipped to our walk-in cooler, or sometimes I just do it with masking tape, that says what's in the cooler. Everything in our cooler is labeled. So if there's a tote of arugula, it's weighed and has a label on it. It has the date and how much it weighs. So as I get all of my orders and I go through this sheet and I put all this stuff into my harvest tally, I've got a list of all the things that I need to harvest. Before we head out in the field, I'll go to my walk-in cooler, look in the cooler and make adjustments as to what's in stock. Okay, so let's say I've got six pounds of arugula in the cooler. I put that on here. I subtract the difference. I need to harvest 13 pounds. So it's just, it's just a field sheet. It's simple, right? It's not the exact orders. It's just what I'm going to take with me in the field. So that was it. That was, that's what I was just explaining. What's in stock? That's my in stock. So we, we, we first arrive at a tally of everything needs to harvest. What's in stock? What's the difference? On this sheet too, I've got crop locations. Where is that crop? For me on a multi-locational farm, that's really important for me. On a, on a single site farm, perhaps less important, but you might call it block locations or block number or, or bed number or something like that. On our farm, every single plot is, is named and is numbered. So it'll be Borden Avenue plot, beds 1 through 24. I will put that on there because, again, everything in writing is super key, especially when you're working with a team, because I've said before, go harvest that arugula. They harvest the wrong one. I was hoping to have that one for next week. Now I've got a bed of arugula that's too big. So you really need to be specific with this stuff. Was, who, yeah. So uh, you're receiving these orders, I assume, mostly by email? Actually, mostly by text message. So are you taking your Tuesday, Friday, like administrative time to enter these into a spreadsheet? Or... No, the orders I'm doing on Thursday morning. So that's a, different, that's a different admin time. My Tuesday, and, and thanks, thanks for pointing that out. I should have been more clear about that. My main admin, admin time for inputting data into my sheets as far as what's coming off the field, what's being planted, that's on Tuesdays and Fridays. My orders and stuff like that, that's Thursday morning because that's when I've capped out Thursday, 9 a.m., you got to have your orders in. That's when I get that flood of orders and I'm putting all that information and then sorting these sheets accordingly. So you're pulling up your text sitting at your computer? Literally. Yeah, that's a good one. So, so Max is asking about the Farmigo problem, pro, uh, programs, and there's some of these software apps out there that allow people to do orders for you. Um, short answer, I'm making my own. And the other thing that I don't like about those programs is that I actually want to talk to my chefs. This is important to me as a, as a market gardener to know my customers. And, and I think like there's a lot of people trying to get on this bandwagon of just streamlining everything so that the, 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 the restaurant's talking to the software and the software's talking to you. It's true that that does streamline some things. But at the same time, there's a lot of value in talking to your chefs. 
right? They're, you're getting updates with them and how busy they are, what their volumes are, what they expect next week. Like there's a ton of information there. And if you, if you just pass off those interactions, I think there's, there could be a loss in value for the farmer. So I've looked at them. I'm trying to make my own with my own fresh sheet. But I like to personally talk to my chefs each week, and I like to go in the restaurants and see what they're doing. I like to see how they're using the food. I like that interaction. It gi it's given me a lot of value. It seems like with customers placing orders that day, a program like that might not be as necessary. Mm -hmm. I think those programs are often most applicable when it's sort of like you're a hub and you're ordering from other growers. I think they're more applicable then because then you're coordinating all this other stuff that could save you a lot of time. Like there's a new program out. It's a new decentralized food hub software. It's called Ubi Out of Our Own Backyards. It's, a, it's an acronym started in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. And, they're, and they're, that's what they're doing. They're coordinating. So somebody sets up a food hub business they, they're filling boxes, and then this program is, is coordinating all the stuff with all the other growers, which I see a lot of value in that because that's a lot of back and forth. But as far as if you're a small farm, you know, you're a half acre, you're an acre, even you know, a couple acres, and you're selling to, you've got 20, 30 customers, personally, I think that personal interaction is important. It's important to a small business. It might not be with the biggest farms like Susie's Farm down in San Diego here, but the small ones, I think it is important. Yeah, just There's another one, uh, Open Food Network. It's not here in the States yet, but uh, I think it's in France and Europe and Australia. There's a guy here, Dame Anselm, who I think is doing kind of an impromptu talk on it because he's uh, helping develop it in France and trying to help bring it here to the States. And it's just a software? Yeah, it's, a, it's an open source software. So that's another open source software, yeah. Open Food Network? Open food Network. Dot com? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so dot org. org, okay, openfoodnetwork.org. Um, so there's other ways we can view this information. So portioning. So once we've harvested from the field, our, our harvest tally sheet is no longer needed. Now what we're doing is we're going to sift through our orders and, and buy our items again. So we've got it in items. So now when we've got all the product back on the farm, we're still using these sheets. So now we're going to have this same itemized grouping or sorting with the same sheet with our orders, not the harvest tally, and we're going to pack this way. So we're going to just do all the arugula. So we pull the arugula out of the cooler and we're gonna pack all the arugula. So we're gonna go do all the case lot bags for the restaurants. Some people will do it where they pack the farmer's market stuff at the same time. We don't, we do all the farmer's market stuff near the end of the day. We, we, we do all of our packing for restaurants first. So I'll take out my bins of arugula, pack the case lots, I'll consolidate it and then put farmer's market arugula and I'll put that back in the cooler and then my helpers who come to help me pack for the market on Friday afternoon, they'll sort that out for the small portioned bags for the market. We do all the restaurant stuff first. So we're just going through item for item, packing all that stuff or portioning all that stuff, I should say, and then we, we're going to pack it. So now I take the same sheet and I'm going to sort it by customer. So it's, it's the same information, but I've just sorted it in a different way. So now I go through by customer. Now I'm going to pack all those orders. So it does seem a little bit inefficient for us to pack stuff, put it in the cooler, and then take it back out and then pack it into boxes for specific orders. But we have to do it because it's hot where we are. We can't have product sitting outside of the cooler for very long. So that's why we pack things, we portion things, put them back in the cooler, they're labeled. So one box will say, you know, case lot bags of arugula for restaurants, case lot boxes of spring mix, whatever it is, so that when, we, when we're going to pack before we deliver, we've basically set up our bike trailers or our truck, it's all there, and then we pull out all the case lot stuff that's packed, and all we're doing is essentially just going through like this. We're just laying out boxes. We, we reuse these um, certified organic boxes we get from the back of uh, organic grocery stores like Whole Foods. They give them to us. They let, them take, we, they let us take them. And we just you know, put a piece of tape on the box, and then we're just, okay, there's Quails Gates order. He wants a case of arugula. He wants a case of spinach. He's got a box of spring mix. Whatever it is, it's all labeled. It isn't till then that I go and print my invoices because at this point, there still could be shortages, right? Hopefully at this point, I know that there's not going to be, but you never know. So once everything's packed up 
and it's all boxed up like this, then I will run inside, do my invoices, and I'll show you that at the very end of this, and then I'm off to the races, load the truck, I'm gone, or load the bike trailers, and we go and deliver. So that's how that essentially works for us. Every, we do this every week, entire season. That's kind of how that routine works for us and how we use those sheets. Any questions about that so far? Okay, because we're going to... Well, okay, yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Well, I was about to say, just the sheets seem like such a big part of this. Uh, how did you learn how to use, use Excel? I know it's kind of a learning curve for some people dealing with formulas, tailoring, you know, so... Yeah, yeah I, I learned it just from trial and error, and I don't, I don't... I'm not big on formulas. Like, I do have formulas in there in the sense that I've got units, unit weight, and then this is just, a, I go equals, and this is this times this. So I have some of these formulas that just autofill in there. But I, I'm, not, I'm not advanced with spreadsheets as I could be where I've got different sheets that have stuff connected and all that. I'm not quite there. This is just function. It functions great for us. There's probably some software out there that could make it better. And, and again, that's why I'm working on an app. But um, yeah. That's essentially, and it's just trial and error. But the sheets that I have on my website are just, have simplified a lot of that process for you. There's a whole chapter on, in the book, too, if you don't get it all today. Any more questions so far? Because we're going to leave everything to do with restaurant orders and all that. We're going to look at more production stuff. Yeah, John. Just the last two questions. Um, do you use any invoicing software at all? Like yes. Yeah, I use invoicing software. We're going to talk about that at the end. What's the most sustainable packaging? Yeah, where do you get packaging from? Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, the sustainable packaging packaging thing is. Um, I'm okay. I'm thinking cost. Where do you get the? Yeah, I mean, we order from. There's suppliers like Uline. There's. Um, I get most of my packing bags from a local store in my area called Lizgen. They're just a retail marketing store. Um, there's just just search. In your own area, just search uh, retail supplies kind of thing. Usually, they'll have the four-ounce bags. They'll have the, the roll bags for the bulk orders, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, we have, I have that problem. We don't have a good retail. Well, then a company like Uline, they, they're, they're a U.S. company. They, they ship all that stuff. They'll have all that kind of packing material for you. Yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, so the question was if I use those, you know, uh, PayPal or Square or whatever. Yes, um, I don't use them anymore just because no, no, none of my customers need them. But they're great. That's a great way to get COD. That's like the best way to get COD. Yes, the credit card company takes three percent or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I've, I've used that. It's actually really helped me get paid sometimes because, like, I do have one. I just never use it. Um, is I go into a restaurant. And they're like four weeks behind paying, and I show up with that, and they say, oh, we don't have a check for you today. I'm like, oh, well, that's okay. You can just pay them in your credit card. Here you go. <laughs> and they're, usually they're, they will pay you, because they're not going to say, well, no, because then you know they're full of shit, right? <laughs> so, so, yeah, that, those are great. My, my friend Steve, who's a, a really cool um, sort of alternative economist in Kelowna, he says, the more ways you have to get paid, the more you get paid. So I can actually take Bitcoin, credit card, cash. I'll take gold and silver. I'll take, I'll take barter, you know, barter to a certain degree. Granted that you have something that I actually want. But yeah, the more ways you have to get paid, the more you get paid. Any more thoughts on, uh, thoughts, questions on restaurants? All right. So planting. Recording how you're, what, what goes in the field recording um, how much of things you planted, how many beds you planted, how did you plant it. All of that stuff is really important. This all relates to our field sheet for plantings. So in this, with this sheet, we're specifically talking about direct seeded crops and transplanted crops. So only things that go in the field, things that are for microgreens or planted in the nursery, that's something else altogether. So what goes in the field is what this sheet is for. And again, don't worry about all the little information on this sheet. You, you've got, you can download it on the website, and it's actually, this one's actually referenced in the book. The three most important things to, to note about this sheet are the date, the crop, and the location. 
That, those are the, the, the most important things what, for, for what was planted because it's used and compared to a yield sheet. So I don't know why I had three of these in here. Um, there is on the planting sheet and the yield sheet that, we, that, that um, I'll show you coming up, these three fields are exactly the same. So when something goes in the field and is, is direct seeded, I'll record the date, the crop, and um, the location so that when, it, when I go back and I harvest that crop and I put that information into my yield sheet, it starts with the same information, the date, the crop, and the location. So now I can go, I can, the two correlate. So I'll go to my yield sheet, which is this one, and I will look on it and say, oh no, it's this one. I'll look at it and say, well, how much of that crop did I get? When did I harvest it? I'll go back to my planting sheet and I'll put that date in here. So this, the planting sheet is really the ultimate sheet that has the most amount of information because on this sheet, I'm tracking all the three things I just mentioned, even a crop variety, how long the bed was, was it direct seeded or was it transplanted? What was the DOE, what was the DTH, and what was the DTM? So the DOE, this is a good thing to track. This is your date of emergence. This tells you how quickly that crop germinated from seed. So it's only relevant to direct seeded crops, not as much to, to transplanted crops. Because something like arugula, for example, in the springtime you'll plant it, it might take 10 days to pop out of the ground. But in the summertime, it'll pop out of the ground in three days. And everywhere in between, there's going to be slight variations. So when, by recording this stuff, it really tells you what is the optimal time and the quickest time that crop will grow. Because crops are very nuanced. Some crops do better in the spring than they do in the summer. Like spinach germinates better and faster in the, in the sort of mid-spring than it would in the summer. Sometimes in the summer, it won't even germinate at all. It's too hot. So tracking all this information over time gives you a real skeleton of what your next season should look like. And if you do this for a year and you're methodical about it, I guarantee you, when you start up the next season, you'll have a total framework in front of you on how you can adjust expectations. So if I plant arugula today, when can I expect it to be ready? You can really only figure that out if you do this tracking yourself. I can tell you in my book what it's been for me, but that might not be what it is for you. So this kind of stuff is very nuanced to your own situation. So the date of emergence is when that crop came out of the ground. The date to harvest was the date that you harvested that crop, and that will go back in the planting sheet. And then the DTM, which is the days to maturity, is a subtraction between the, DT, the date to harvest and the, and the date planted. The difference is how many days did that crop take to mature. If you do that for an entire year, you'll have an amazing framework for how to go into the next season. So that's, that's our planting sheet. Oh, yeah, so that's what this is. So this is my direct seeded stuff. These are, these are what started in the nursery, and some of these are what was transplanted. So I can sort this at any given time. I have this, these fields up here, NS. I'll just say NSDS, which means nursery or direct seeded or transplanted or whatever. I can sort it by that and say, show me all of my direct seeded crops. It's all there. Show me all of my transplanted crops. It's all there. It helps you filter and figure out what's working and what doesn't by sorting the information. You can't sort it in a, in a, in a journal the same way you can on a spreadsheet. So same thing there. That's for, all of, that's for all of our field stuff. So in the nursery, same thing. When, when did we start a crop? When did that crop emerge? When do we expect to transplant that crop into the ground? So it's just an extension of the field sheet. You can keep them the same if you like. I prefer to keep them separate because this one might have more information on it. Like I'll have more information on here about how many cells, what was the size of the cell flat that I did? Was it a 72? Was it a 128? Was it a 200? Was it a 400 cell soil block flat? All that information is on here. I prefer it to be separate just because this one has more fields. And if this is just essentially a modification of the first one. So microgreens, I keep this entirely separate because this one, there's just way more information on here and I'm updating it more constantly. So when do I plant microgreens? When did I harvest them? Everything that I do with microgreens is done on this sheet. It's not too different from all the other sheets, but there, there, I don't need as much information on here. And you can still see here that there's really only about 
five fields or six fields on this that I consistently use. The date it was planted, the crop, how many grams of seed I used, how many flats I planted, what was the yield, and what was, or what was the yield per pounds, what was the yield per grams. Canadians are confused about imperial and metric, so we, we like to use both of them. Don't ask me why, but we do. And so that's really all I need. So on my, on my microgreens sheet, I use it as a planting and a yield sheet, just because they're so consistent, right? I'm planting might be the same thing every week, 10 flats of pea shoots every week, and I harvest those 10 days later. So it just all goes in here. That, that way I've got it all in one place. It allows me to track my averages, look at my average yield. How much seed am I using? Oh, I'm getting more yield off this type of seed than others. If, you, if some of you guys were in Chris Thoreau's workshop about microgreens, he probably would have talked about different seed varieties and how some black oil sunflower seeds will yield really high and some white striped sunflower seeds will have a different yield. And so I track all that stuff. I'll, I'll put in my notes, was this a different seed lot? Was it, was it something different than I was used to? I track all that stuff. Because if you don't track it, you don't really know where you're at. You don't, you're not setting up expectations and, and recording them. So yields is very important. What comes off the field? What are, what are we, how much are we yielding on average for a bed of carrots? What are we averaging for a bed of lettuce, a bed of spinach? How do we know this stuff? If we don't record it, we don't really know where we're at. So the yield sheet is almost like the planting sheet. In the, the, same, the first three fields are always the same. Date, crop, plot. Everything else we've got in here, over like how many yields or bunches did we pull out of it? What was the area? So here we got a bed of arugula. This was a 53 foot bed. I harvested 26 pounds. So I have a little yield ratio in there. And that correlates, so this is how many how, many, how much yield did I get per foot? So it's just dividing the yield by the length of the bed. It gives me a yield ratio. If any of you guys have read my book or you're coming to the workshop tomorrow, I'll talk more about this system of rating a crop I have called a CVR, a crop value rating system. I have, say, target yields. If, if a crop is high value, I want to get a half a pound of, per linear foot of bed. So I use that to track this kind of thing. What are the averages? What am I getting? Per, per linear foot of bed for these crops. What is the profit per foot or flat of that crop? This gives me a way to look back and see, am I meeting my benchmarks? And I've always got a notes field because I might be out in the field and I'm harvesting something and I go, oh, wait a second, this is really low yield. Why is that? I might write that in my spreadsheet and then I'll use that information at a later time in the year to figure out, do I see a, a pattern in these trends? I had consistent failings of germination of arugula in July and August. Is there a pattern there? Did it happen with a particular seed variety? Did it happen because I was planting the bed too dense or I was planting the bed too wide? Was there an irrigation problem? All of these things allow you to ask better questions to problem solve situations because there's always things to problem solve on a farmer. That's essentially what we do as farmers. So the, planting sh the, the, the yield sheet d directly correlates to the planting sheet the date, the plot, and the crop are the things that are consistently recorded on that sheet. The date harvested is the, it, uh, this very important on that sheet. The date of emergence and the DTM, which is the days to maturity, those are the most important pieces of information on this sheet, and it directly correlates to the planting sheet. So that is, again, our yield sheet. Okay, so those are the three most common ones that I use on the farm, and we'll look at a, a couple others, and then we'll have time for questions, and then we'll wrap up the day. So spoilage is important to track, mostly because it tells you what you're not selling. Like I said earlier, you can sometimes use it for tax write-offs, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, and you've got to be careful about that. But this information just tells you, okay, I, I had 15 pounds of arugula comp composted this week. That's $150 a crop that I didn't sell. Maybe I'm producing too much arugula, right? Oh, I wasted 30 pounds of tomatoes last year. Maybe I'm producing too many tomatoes. All this stuff is just a better way for you to understand what's working and what isn't working, what's selling and what isn't. And it'll, it'll give you a better frame when you go forward into the next season, decide, well, maybe I'll do a little bit less tomatoes this year. Maybe I'll do more arugula and lettuce. 
If you don't track it, you won't know where you're at. But again, sometimes you can use this for tax purposes, but it's hard to say whether you can do that in California here or not. I'm not totally sure. Yeah? That's a good question. Is there a tax benefit to donating stuff to food banks? Again, it depends on your jurisdiction. I know for certain that some people will get a receipt, so that's a great way to do it. I donate all my spoilage to the um, food banks anyways. I just I don't need a receipt from them because I can claim it. I can just claim the spoilage. But some, if, if it is a jurisdiction that requires that, then you would want to do diligence and, and make sure that you get a receipt from them so that you do have something to show. And if that's the case, then you've got, as a small business person, you've got a more incentive to donate it than to compost it because then you get that, that receipt. Um, another way you can do it, these guys in New Zealand were doing this. They were, what were they doing? They were selling it. Yeah, they, there's sort of a loophole on how they could donate it because the government wouldn't let them use receipts from a donation to, for tax purposes. But what they were doing is that they were selling the product to the, to the charitable organization and then giving them the money back. So the money was the charitable, charitable donation for the, for, the, um, for the tax purposes. So it's kind of like, you know, you find these creative ways to navigate the system and every corporation does this stuff, so why, why shouldn't we do it, right? Um, we don't want to pay tons of tax if we're working and sweating on the farm like we do. So, okay, so that is spoilage. It's simple. There's not really much else to explain besides from that is tracking what is wasted, what wasn't sold, what goes in the compost piles and, and what was donated. This is a sheet that is very simple, but I find super effective on figuring out where I'm at with my farm. So I call it a weekly overview. It basically is just a top end information of what's my total weekly revenue. So this is a total of what I sold at the farmer's market, what I sold for restaurants, what I sold in box programs or whatever market streams I'm selling in. This is just a total. I made $1,000 this week. I made $3,000 this week, whatever it is. But this sheet, is allows me to, to look at fluctuations in sales based on seasonality. It allows me to spot trends and then use that information to speculate on the future. And this is what all stockbrokers do. It's a similar idea. So this is just an overall, this is all the weeks of my season that I'm in operation and how much I made each week. So I've got 35 weeks in production here. My farmer's market season might start in April and my you know, my, my market might end here at the end of November, but I'll have a bit of shoulder season sales to restaurants or cafes or things like that. So this is my, my all the top end weekly sales. So I can do things like this. I can isolate in here and go, okay, look at, from here I get to $2,000 a week and then that starts to taper down about here. So this is my primary marketing season. This is my, not high season, but it's my primary market season. Whereas here, I go from, in May, making $1,000 a week on the farm to making $3,900, $4,000 a week, so on and so forth. So you can isolate your peak seasons. And this is important because it, it sets up expectations for you to know when are you going to be really hitting the ground. Like, when are you going to be hammering it out? Once we get into peak season, we're just, we're, we're maxed out. There's, there's not really much else we can do to increase production. We're day to day, we're doing the same things. We're planting and harvesting. We're rocking and rolling constantly. And these things will allow you to predict the next season. Because if you know, I mean, I, and I've, I've harvested this information for years, I know that this period here from July 13th till August 30th, that is my peak season. That is when every restaurant is wanting as much as I can sell them. It's when I'm sometimes shorting consistently and where everybody's busy because it's, it's all, for, in my market, it's all based on tourism. So I've identified that period as my, my peak season. So when you look at that chart, you go, okay, this is the time that we have very little screwing around that can happen. When that time comes on, we need to make sure that we are ready for it, that we've got everything that's going to be available on the field is available. We've got to make sure that we're not wasting time on tasks that are going to occupy time outside of selling, planting, and harvesting, we need to make sure that we're ready for that period. So I just know that that is my peak season. But it might be different for you guys. 
It's, di it's different everywhere. It depends on what your market circumstances are. So there's times on this sheet too where I'll put notes on this sheet. This isn't the whole sheet, but I can have a notes factor to say this week here, we did $3,900 in sales. I was short on lettuce and radishes this week. So that's the top end information. I don't need to know exactly how much, but I want to know that. So next year when I review this, I can see all the top end information of boiling this information down further. So we looked at all that before. We looked at my, my, sell, my, uh, my sales sheets, my yield sheet, my planting sheet. This is the top end stuff, what's coming off the farm. And it, it just, it's basically like the chapter overviews. It's like the index of a book. Right? It's like, what's the top end stuff? And then how do I navigate from there? So if I put information of notes on here of trends, I see you know, consistently short on lettuce at this period of time, consistently short on this, had too much of this. Then I'll look at that as an overview and then go further into my sheets and go from there. But this is the top place to start because it's just like reading the, 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 the overview of a book, the outline of a book. Okay, one little bit, and then we'll go, into, we'll go into questions and just finish the day with that. So accounting software I do use. There's many different softwares out there. It's all very important, especially if you're dealing with <coughs> bigger accounts. If you're selling to restaurants and you're selling to people on terms, you really should have some kind of accounting software. There's many out there. There's QuickBooks. There's Zero. The one I use is called Account Edge. There's nothing really particularly special about it. It was just what was available to me at the time. You can use this for doing your budgets, expenses, and all that, but I mostly just use it for invoicing. I, I keep everything else in spreadsheets. That's just my preference, but please you know, do it however you think is, is the best way to do it. But what I do with this is it just manages my account. So when I go to print out an invoice, so after I've put together all my orders on a particular day, I can open up this software, open up a new invoice here, and in seconds, I can fill out a multi-line item because everything autofills. So all I need to know is certain keystrokes that just will autofill. So I can go, if I'm putting in spinach, I just go SP1. It autofills all the information and the price, and I hit tab. So I can fill out a 20-line invoice in seconds just by doing numbers and quick keys. So it takes some getting used to, but it really makes it easier because if you're going to be filling out these old school things, which most farmers do, you're standing there and writing it all out, and it sometimes takes five minutes to fill out a 20-line like a invoice. The other problem with these things is that if you lose your carbon copies, you have no recourse. You have no knowledge of who owes you money or not. The beauty of the software is that it tracks who's settled up their invoices and who doesn't. So every week when I'm on stream by about mid-May, I start to get checks that are just coming in on stream every single week. I'm getting checks from restaurants. When I get those checks, I go onto my accounting software. This is something I would do as part of my Tuesday night or Friday night routine in the office. I go in and I just open up their account and I just select their invoices and they'll have a check that has a pay stub on it that says this invoice number, this amount, so on and so forth. I just go in and input that into the computer, paid, done. So now I, I know who's paid for what invoice and who hasn't. So that if somebody is short, all I have to do in my software, if like they haven't paid me recently, is I go into my sales, I go into my sales register, I select the name of the restaurant, and then I can go view open invoices. So it'll just show me all the invoices that they haven't settled up. In seconds, I can grab that and print a statement or email them a statement that just has, you know, these invoices, these amounts, here's the total. Hey guys, haven't seen a check from you in a couple weeks. Here's just a reminder of of the invoices that haven't been settled. Thank you. You know, you can just be really brief and you can stay on top of them. You'll get paid more. Sometimes you just have to keep bugging these people. But generally I would say if you have to continuously bug people for money, then they're probably not the best customer. But this allows you to just know where you're at. Who owes me money and who doesn't? It's, it's really that simple. And it just makes the invoicing faster. Um, these, I still, I have these, I keep them around my farm just in case a chef calls me midweek and is like, oh man, we're out of lettuce. Can I come by and grab some lettuce? I'll often say, yeah, sure. Slide by. And one of the people, myself or somebody else will fill out an invoice for them, give it to them just so we don't have to go back in the office to print it. But then I'll put that into the system later on. So it's, it's just there as an, as an option. 
So that is essentially it, you guys. Um, <laughs> we'll go into questions after this, but I'll just do a little review of the things that we looked at. Know your market. Know what, know what, you're, what you're getting into before you start selling. Never walk into a saturated market. Keep records of all the important information. The planting, the yields, the, and the marketing, and the sales information is the top information. Everything else is important, such as budget and expenses and all that, but the weekly information is really important, and you've got to create habits to keep up with that. Use the technology. Use your phone. Use the spreadsheets. They're all there. They're all available. Find time to review the stuff, and it, it's good to do that throughout the season, to stop and just look at where you're at. Look at your yields. Keep an idea of where things are going with your farm. Look at the plantings. Always have an assessment of where you're at. And then look for trends and then use that information to speculate on the future. So that's how you can make guesses of what you think is going to happen the next season based on what happened last year. Those kind of things will really help you, and I'm certain that they'll help you learn faster and, and be more successful quicker. Thanks, guys. So if we, if we have any questions, I'll just leave this stuff up again. Um, tons of free info on my uh, YouTube channel. There's the podcast I do with Diego, online course, coupon code if anybody wants it. And uh, yeah, let's take some questions. Yeah, John. Yeah. Right. I can't grow enough to keep up with the demand that is there. And so to be worried about keeping up relationships with 20 different farmers, I'm, I have people that are, I'm either selling to a CSA, I'm selling to another person who's doing all that hard leg work, and I'm going to get my food and, and using those hubs. I'm personally, that's less energy and time and mental. I just like watching what you have to do. <laughs> do keep, well, that, but, but it's all context, right? My farm is small. I'm not managing a 100-member CSA. I was. I used to have a 100-member CSA. But we're small. And so I spend an hour a week on, on those sheets, not including inputting my orders and stuff. But and you're around a lot of those restaurants around. You know, That's it. That's it. You know, if you've, if, you know, it's just all context. If, if you've got so much demand for product and you can move it through a hub and that works for you, yeah, that's easy. That's easy. I personally, myself though, I like to be diversified as, with customers. I find being diversified with customers is just as important as being diversified with crops because businesses come and go, people come and go, trends change. There's a, we're changing marketplace all the time. There's so many new innovations that's happening in the sector with food and, and uh, agriculture that who knows what it's going to look like in 20 years. So I, I, I like the diversified approach as far as customers, and so that's generally why I, I, I trend towards restaurants, because I have many different types of restaurants and farmer's market customers, and I've kind of leaned back from the CSA. Uh, talking about those boxes that you get from like Whole Foods and things, are there other things that you kind of save costs on that you find like throughout the season that you can kind of just get? You know? uh, yeah, I get these, I get those. To, oh, yeah, so the question was... Um, how do I, uh, those boxes that I get that are recycled from the back of grocery stores, if there's other things that I get that are like that. I also get these tomato flat boxes. I get them from the same grocery stores, and they're great for harvesting tomatoes because we don't have to have big layers of tomatoes. We fill these boxes, and it's just one layer of tomatoes, and they store better, and we deliver to those tomatoes in those, like we can pack 10 pounds in one of those flats. We sell that as a case lot. So, so I would say those, um, that's about it, really. No, I, that's a good question about, you, you know, do you, can you use recycled tarps? Yes, you can. You can use recycled anything you want. But the question is, is it worth the time? I, I found over the years it's not. I, I used to go and get all these lumberyard tarps, and I'd, I'd have to cut because they were, they, were, they were sewed so they'd fit on a piece of, like a lumber stack. And so I'd get all them because I'd get them for free. I had a friend at the lumber yard, but I'd have to cut them all up and then lay them all over the plot, put different, you know, had to have all these different things laying down. It was just a hassle. So it's just a cost-benefit analysis of whatever it is you're, you're looking at.
Yeah. Start tracking That's a good question, Scott. Um, yeah, so Scott's question was, is it worth it to track your time at the beginning for particular farm tasks than it is to once you get good at it? I would say yes, there is, because then you use that as a benchmark on how you can improve. I like that. When I, was, when I was starting out, it was really cool to track how long it took me to harvest a bed of radishes, like you said, and then after four weeks, noticing that I'm doing it twice as fast. So I, I like that kind of stuff because I like goal setting. I just find that when you have these benchmarks to work towards, you can always find better ways to improve on and, and increase the speed or increase the quality. So I would say yes, but you know, don't, don't kill yourself in managing it at the beginning. It's good to know, but you know, try to streamline it in. Try to, you know, with some of the technology I've shown, try to find ways where you can really easily record that stuff. But you know, if, it's, if it's pissing rain out and you're, kneel, you're bending over harvesting radishes, don't worry about recording your time. Do it when it's convenient, but do it enough that you do see benchmarks that you can improve on. Yeah, Jesse? Recording uh, for Evernote, do you use the basic program or do you pay for one of the premium ones? Or... Um, for, for Evernote, I, have, I use the basic one. I probably upgraded the premium because I use it a lot now, and the premium's got some better features in it. But I, I've, I've been able to use the basic one for years. Yeah. Any, any benefits to save your body as far as harvesting goes? Yes, the right tools. The, the Quick Greens Harvester is, is a very worthwhile investment, $500 tool. It'll save you thousands of dollars in, in, in labor, save you a lot of strain on your back. You still have to bend over with that tool, but it's less bending over, and it's faster. So that tool for sure. Um, What's the name again? The Quick Greens Harvester, Quick Cut Greens Harvester. Guy named Jonathan, I believe in Tennessee, invented it. What's that? Is it on back order? Man, yeah, I guess people are people like JM and I are promoting it so much that everybody wants it, uh, and it's it's a great tool. Um, I would say is outside of that, it's just a lot of technique stuff. I've got a lot of videos on YouTube actually on how to harvest specific things. Um, in my workshop, sometimes we get into it. Um, yeah, it's just, it's appropriate technology. I mean, the way our beds are structured is really, a, it's a classic example of how function defines form. The fact that we use a 30-inch bed is I can stand over that bed. I can walk across my plot because I can step over the beds. I've got access in and out. It increases my, it, it decreases my transit time. So things like that are really built into the system. It, and it's yeah, ultimately about ergonomics. I can stand over that bed easily this way. I can kneel in it one way. I can, I can have different positions on the bed. I think the, the whole basic idea of the 30-inch bed is based around ergonomics and accessibility. So I think it really kind of comes down to that more than it does specific tools. Um, when you do your pitch, it's something like grow this much money on this much land. Does that take into account uh, the whole landscape that you're working on or actually the growing bed space? Yeah. The yeah, so the, the question was, when I'm talking about numbers or projections of what I can pull off a plot, is it based on beds or just perimeter and, and whole area? It's based on beds. So in my book I, or in the, in the online course, as, as you know, is, is, is a 30-inch bed, 25 feet in high rotation can make $800 on average. That's a conservative estimate. So when I, when I look at a plot and I could look at, say, a 2,000-square-foot area, I can just guess, okay, I can probably fit 20 beds in there. If I did high rotation, that would be $16,000 or, or whatever the, the multiplier is of it. And on that kind of follow-up, is that have you looked at any ways of uh, maximizing the profitability of actually growing something in the past ways like mushrooms? Uh, yes, I have looked at other ways to maximize that. Um, mushrooms are tricky in my context because my walkways are narrow. I mean, for where, where your guys' farm, that sounds like something that's a lot more f feasible for you. The way I do it on my farm are things like interplanting. So interplanting tomatoes into the walkways of our greenhouses, patty pan squash, interplanting beds of quick crops in between the rows when they first go in, kind of time-based strategies on how long will this primary crop take to grow before it will affect the crop that's planted next to it. So it's usually pairing a longer season crop with a quick short season crop. Does a quick cut harvester affect how the crops regenerate, like if you're cutting spinach? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So does the quick cut greens harvester affect the regeneration of a particular crop? Um, yes, it does, but it's actually better. I find it, because it cuts flat, it, you get a consistent cut and you get a consistent regrowth. Whereas when you're going by hand, it takes more time, but also there's going to be slight inconsistencies and variability in the lengths because we're human. We're not, we're not a machine that is perfectly level. So I think it's actually better than, than when we used to do it by hand. And it's a 20th of the time. Last year you talked about Salanova lettuce. I'm just curious how that worked out for you. Salanova, amazing. Yeah, Salanova lettuce. We do all of our lettuce with Salanova now. Um, we do, it is, we plant it as a head at six inch centers. I use landscape fabric for it. There's a video up on my YouTube channel about making those fabrics. And so there's six inch centers. We have to harvest it by hand, which takes a bit more time, but the yield is so high that it's, it's still very much worth it. Um, the Salanova I plant, if you want to write this down, is I, I grow four varieties. 75% of all the lettuce is one called Green Sweet Crisp. That comes from Johnny's. And then the other three are basically the remaining 25%. I use red sweet crisp, green, green butter, and red butter. Those are the four I use. And green sweet crisp is, like I said, by a huge order of magnitude more than the rest because it's the highest yielding and fastest growing. Yeah, Rob? Do you, do you have that little coring tool that they sell? It comes, yeah, they, they send it to you the first time you order it. I, I don't know. I don't use that. Because we're, we're harvesting it as a cut and come again crop, right? I'm, I'm standing over that bed, grabbing it by hand, and I'm, sh I'm cutting it off, leaving about an inch of foliage, and then it grows back. So that coring tool is if you're selling it by the head to a chef, and they use that to cut all the leaves at uniform sizes. What do you mean if you were to cut it right? What do you mean? No. Well, it would in a funky looking way. And that's the thing you have to be careful with Salanova is if you cut it too low to the point where it's just white, it looks like a, a kind of a cut stem, you'll get very little regrowth. You want to cut it so that you've got about an inch off the ground and about an inch and a half to two inches wide of leftover. So there's enough foliage there to photo, get a lot of photosynthesis, but enough surface area where each of those leaves can actually grow back. And I, we, that was a big um, trial and error thing for us. Is at first we were cutting it too low and we we're getting barely any regrowth. We just found if we cut a little bit higher, we got way better second cuts and third and fourth cuts. Can you uh, speak to just maybe some tips or some observations you've had for people that are either in like niche type markets or part timers, like doing what you're doing, but on, on a part time scale? So, can I speak to people doing this kind of farming on a part time scale? Like they're going to, they want to transition or something? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there, there, there's a chapter on it in the book, like specifically on different farm plans that I've consulted people for and that I've seen, or if I were to do this again, what I would do. Um, but to touch on it again, yeah, I think it's a really ideal situation. If, if you're in a day job and you know, you've got a job that you might not like, but you make a good enough income from it, if you are in a situation where you've got a front and back yard and you think you could get some production on it, like based on my numbers, I show people that, hey, you can make 20 grand in 2,000 square feet. Um, so you could say, hey, let's, let's do a leafy greens specifically focused niche. Let's, let's grow greens at the farmer's market and sell to a couple cafes or restaurants. Maybe our target is to only make 20 grand a year. We do that by working you know, we scale back our hours at work. Maybe you say, okay, if, you, if, if I work 40 hours a week, Monday to Friday, how about you go to your boss and say, is it possible to work 40 hours at Monday to Thursday? And then have Fridays as a harvest day, and then Saturdays at a market, and then you've got maybe a couple evenings or early mornings you're working in your farm to manage it. Totally possible to do. If you're going to do that, though, you want to go super niche, like, like what you said. You don't want to grow a bunch of different stuff. You want to grow a couple small varieties of things that you think you can produce in volume. I think greens would be the best one, but it depends on your market, right? If there's not a demand for greens, then I wouldn't do that. Maybe it's growing cherry tomatoes in, in a greenhouse, or maybe it's growing baby root vegetables and microgreens. You know, a microgreens business is a very stackable one that you could start with a shelving unit, like one of the ones I showed earlier, 
You know, you can grow $1,000 of microgreens a week very easily, like 10 hours of work or less with packaging, harvesting, washing, delivering, all that kind of stuff. You can stack that onto a part-time job or almost full-time job if you're willing to kind of transition, spend a couple of years where you're kind of grinding it out. But the great thing about that um, system is that say you're onto your second or third year, you might at this point have enough of a customer base established, enough of social equity built up in your community where you can say, you know what, I can transition to a full-time farmer now. I already know all the little uh, nuances of running this and just go for it. I've seen it done many times and I, I, think, I think it's probably the best way to, tr to do this. If, if, you can, if you can scale your job back and you're in a situation that you can do that, I, I would totally encourage people to do it. Again, man, it, de it depends on your situation. Like, it depends, on that, it depends on that farmer's market, like the stuff we looked at the beginning when we were assessing what makes a good market and what would be appealing to sell at that one for. It's all about that. I mean, it really depends on your situation. My, my impulse would be to say, if you could just do restaurants, you'd be laughing because you wouldn't have to do weekends, right? If I didn't have to sell the, at the market and just do restaurants, I'd have Saturday and Sunday off every weekend. That would be super. But I actually really like the farmer's market. I kind of feel empty when I'm not there because I'm so connected to my, my community. Um, but, you know, just for quality of life's sake, if you never did them from the beginning, maybe you don't have to. Sell the five restaurants, shit, that'd be super easy. Then you don't have to individually pack all this stuff. You know, five case lot orders, boom, done. Like, talk about really streaming it into your already job. You know, it'd be simple. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, this is a good question. So Jesse's question was, um, am I operating any under, uh, under rules and regulations that require me to wash certain things a certain way or handle certain things? No, for myself. But this is something that's different in every single jurisdiction down to the municipal, state, or federal level. It's different everywhere. It's different in countries, states, and cities. So you really just have to look at your ordinance, your situation, and, and figure that out. Um, where we are, we're pretty lucky because vegetables are considered low risk by health authorities. So they're the last one to be looked at, whereas dairy, sprouts, and meat products are like the high risk stuff. So the vegetable soil grown things are on the lowest. So we don't, and we're very lucky that we don't because those things can be pretty nebulous sometimes. But you really want to know what those restrictions are before you go in because I have seen farmers that set up and they get ready to roll and then some bureaucrat comes in and shuts them down. So you, you, got, you got to be careful about that stuff. Is there like general liability for yourself? I, yes, so question regarding insurance. Yes, I have a general liability insurance that protects us as far as anything to do with the way if something's sold and somebody gets sick, though those things are extremely hard to actually track, especially with restaurants because the restaurant is usually the one that has the liability insurance, they're the one that's responsible, but we have it. We, that, that insurance also covers if I, at a, one of my garden plots, an irrigation line breaks and I flood my landowner's basement or something like that, that's all covered. I, even in my MOUs and lease agreements, which when you, if you download that stuff from my, from my website, theurbanfarmer.co, there's some lease agreements in there. We'll have stipulations that'll say, in some cases, um, if we have to take out a claim, so say, say it's at a landowner's place, if some, one of my people gets injured there and they have to take out an insurance claim on their property, we'll agree to pay their deductible. So we'll structure that stuff into our contracts too. But yeah, but as far as all the basic insurance stuff, we have it. And it's, it's not much. I think I pay 300 a year for this simple insurance. Yeah. Yeah, so a question about business structures. I have been a sole proprietor up until now, but now I'm a, I'm a corporation. My farm's a corporation. A good accountant will tell you where the, good, the line is for, to do that. Um, you, you, and we don't have LLCs in Canada. Our corporations are slightly different. The way you guys have it set up down here, it seems like you can be operating at a pretty low level and, and justify having an LLC. But for us to incorporate... You really need to be making over a hundred grand to really make it worth it because you pay a lot in in um, fees and services to do that. So it's just different in each country. But we're sole proprietor for most the most part. This might be beyond your niche, but are you, have you considered incorporating like fast growing flowers into your market? 
We, I did it one year. So the question was about incorporating fast growing flowers. I did it one year, but just didn't have enough demand. But I, I personally, I think it's a cash crop. If, if, you can, if you can do it, I mean, I've seen these beautiful little, you know, two ounce or one ounce containers of chrysanthemums and just, you know, a lot of that stuff. Like you can make a lot of money at it. There's a lot of labor with it though, with some of the ones you have to pick the petals off. But I think it's a niche market. I mean, do it if, if that's what you want. I just find that what we did it, it wasn't things that chefs wanted a lot of. It was like people would order $5 of chrysanthemum petals or something like that here and there. Um, a one, one way to do it well is to offer a flower petal salad mix and then sell that at a premium. That's been the best way I've seen. So, you know, you've got a, a normal spring mix, you've got a lettuce mix, mix you've got a spicy mix, you've got a braising mix, and then you might have like a premium mix or call it something really sexy. And then it's got little petals of things here and there. Some high-end restaurants really like that. What about like sunflowers? I mean, you can bring this to restaurants like little bouquets. Yeah, totally. Yeah, selling bouquets. I mean, yeah, man. I mean, there's this huge potential with that if you've got a market for it. Like I know, I know a lot of businesses that just do strictly, strictly flowers. They do perennials and annuals, and they make bouquets, and they kill it. So there's a yeah, huge potential in that. I can't speak to it so much personally, though, because I've only done it to a certain level.